All right, first off, who played that? Was that Doug Rappaport? You uh, asked that Mark. That was him. What? You asked that, that Mark. Mark. That was me. Oh, it was oh, was it you, Mark? Sounds fucking great, man. Oh, thank you. Those Marshalls sound good, Dave. <laughs> you, man. I love you, Dave. I've known you forever. That's so funny. No, you make great shit, man. There's no great about that. He does. Wait, wait, I, you have me back. I mean, isn't this redundant? There's like five billion guitar players, like you know, way better than me. That would be. Oh uh, no, we had to have it. Exciting for the kids today, you know. There's so much that we haven't talked about. We didn't even get the total. Come in and talk to the man with the iron lung. <laughs> You don't know what's below my tits right now. Hey, Pete. I they all rigged up. Pete Thorne is in the chat somewhere. Hey, Pete, man. One of my favorite cats, man. I love this guy. We hung out in Japan. He does great, uh, like, uh, tutorials, you know. With oh, yeah. Stuff, man. Yeah. He's a great player. Where is he? Don't I get to see him? Oh, he's in the chat. He's in the chat. Uh, Here we oh, go. Okay. I, I mean, okay. Hey, Pete. What's up, brother? Yo, what's up, guys? What's up, Pete? I think Pete's uh, around the corner from you, Dave. <laughs> right? <Could> be. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Steve, how you doing, man? Dude, you I'm feeling? doing great, man. I'm, I'm I'm making the most of it. You know, I've I've, no, I, I've never been home this long in my life. I know, right? It's crazy. I lived at home with mom and dad. You know, when I was in high school. When I went. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> We used to just ditch school and go to Lando's house and drink beer and play guitars. I, yeah. I don't recommend this for you kids at home, by the way. Yeah. Right, right, right. I even had a, but, 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 but as you were saying, your one daughter got the hang, hang of it. You, my oldest daughter, yeah, but she doesn't drink no more. I mean, I don't drink no more. It's 11 years yeah. since I, man, my, my madness was cured. Uh, yeah, I don't suggest... Uh, Trying to keep up with the who when you're 19 years old, you know. <laughs> I couldn't and when you're 50, it's just butt ugly, you know what I mean? Um, it goes downhill sometimes. You know, I, you know, back at the time, it was all new, you know. So uh, we believed all the lies, and they were lies. So now kids are smarter than that, or they're supposed to be. Or it's legal. <laughs> well, they, you know. They just doing different drugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, that's the problem. What is all this shit? You know? Oh, yeah. I'm not in the mood to eat somebody's face off at any point of the day. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to eat any. Uh, Look, that reminds me. I've, I've been watching that show. I, I started watching that show. You know, you run out of shit to watch, right? So you start watching, you just start picking things. And it's like we started watching the show like, Hannibal. Hannibal. And when you said eating the face and stuff, I'm like, oh. Yeah. yeah, I like the lighter fare myself. <laughs> as I find as I've gotten older, the lighter fare just works better for me. He's like feeding the HB the the uh, FBI agents uh, people, you know, and they don't know it, and they think they're eating rabbit or something. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes in uh, Hannibal. The one with cut this cuts his head off. Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Eating his brain. And they start singing Daisy. Yeah. <laughs> is that in Hannibal? Or People are fucked up, man. Is that the movie one, or was that? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> we, are, we already have a we already have a question for you, Luke, uh, from Variac ninety. Uh, when did you realize you were good? Not when someone said you were good, but when you came to the realization that hmm, I may be onto something here. Love you, Luke, and thanks, Mark and Dave, for Tone Talk. Cheers. Oh, wow. Well, Thank well, you, man. You know, I started playing really young, and it was a little more freakish than it is today. You know, I was in a band when I was nine. I was making money at it when I was 11. I found a couple other kids that could play with me. So it was sort of like, wow, look at the little kids play. We played at the teenage fair and won, but we weren't teenagers yet, so we didn't get to keep the prize. <laughs> it, was, it was the first time I played through a big stack of acoustic amps, and I zap the shit out of myself because they was playing a curly chord and the grounding was just you know it was just something you got from your parents not an actual tool when you're using electronics you know? i saw god i'm swear to god i was just the microphone was all the way down to the bottom and i lift touched that thing while i was plugged in with, this, with a i think i was playing a jaguar curly cord into like those two uh, acoustic 260s with the horns 
Yeah. I was so fucking loud. I never played anything louder in my life. And then I touched my lip to the microphone because I'm supposed to sing. And it stuck. And I <laughs> it arced and everything like that. I just froze. Oh. Oh. Maybe that's what happened. That was it. That's, that's when your hair became curly, right? Yeah, well, you know, I used to have blonde, <laughs> straight hair. <laughs> that makes more sense now. <laughs> hey, we got another one. Uh, that hi. That wasn't really a very good answer. Um, when oh. did I know I got good? I guess when the you know when people, older people said, hey, that guy's really good, and I was could play good for my age. But you know, good to compare to what I was going along because I could play some Beatle chords and I can, you know, I you know, Beatles songs and I could play the solo in Gloria that Jimmy Page did. The dun, 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 really simple, basic stuff. Mm -hmm. but just I was able to do it, I picked it up and it was just natural to me. So, well, I, don't, I just still don't think I'm any good, but I mean, I mean, I'm okay. There's always guys better, there's always going to be somebody that blows. The guy off the top of the heap, you know what I mean? Of course. I, I'm just glad to still be here 45 years, almost 45 years later. Jesus Christ, where's the time go? Mm, you know, I've tried it all, done it all, played it all, you know, every piece of gear, just about. And, uh, you know, every stupid thing a guy can do, did that too. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're still divorced, around? Divorced twice, did that. Four great kids, though. And I'm still working. I'm, I'm happy. I'm I'm trying to enjoy my life in the midst of the madness, man. You try to make the best of it and get up and take care of myself and play and be I have a wonderful girlfriend who cooks natural food for me. I eat well and I lie in the sun, play with my son in the pool. Awesome. Well, I mean, I try to do normal stuff that I never was allowed to not allowed. I was never around to do. Right. Right. You know, look after the yard, fix up the house a little bit, you know. Yell at the neighbors. I'm, you know, I I'm fortunate enough not to have to, you know, worry too badly about things. Other like than you really loud at the neighbors, I did that once, but you have to understand. I mean, that was such an I could never plan that. Okay, that was completely on the fly. I mean, this guy next door to me, man, he's been bugging me for he moved in and he cut down all my 40 years of brush, and that was not a great way to start the relationship, you know. And then he called the cops on my then six year old autistic kid because he cut the brush, and my kid was in his yard. It's like then I was on the road, and it was. Yeah, it's fun being a parent sometimes. <laughs> anyway, so he was the guy. He had like the, the three leaf blowers at 120 dB, like a plane landing right next to the bedroom side of the house. Living in the Hollywood Hills, the houses are closer together. Mm -hmm. I live in a cul-de-sac, and it's like it's usually really quiet. You know, I live behind gates and all this shit. But this cat started in at 7 a.m., man. 7 a.m., and it was three leaf blowers at 100 zillion dB. And, my, and I'm going, motherfucker, I should put my amp on and just dust this cat. And all I had was my practice amp, you know, the Line 6 brand practice amp. But it was a big one. And my girl goes, do it. I dare you. And, like, you know, I'm, putting up there. You know, I'm still, I'm getting old, but somebody says, dare you. I'll, I'm still an idiot. I'm, Did you just say, dare, you dare me? <laughs> <laughs> like, you think I wouldn't learn after all this demented life I've had? <laughs> I uh, so I did it. I dragged dragged it and put it on top of my uh, my kid my my daughter's trampoline, so I didn't shred the dog's ears. And I cranked it on ten, and my pajamas standing in the wet, you know, just as a joke, playing just just started playing like Pete Townsend stuff, then just shredding and mindlessness. There was no music involved. It was just trying to annoy the cat. And at the end, I started screaming, "Good morning!" in some hideous way. And and Amber, my girlfriend, she uh, recorded it and filmed it and put it up online and it went viral. It was like number five on Reddit and it was on every news station, <laughs> magazines, me and my you know, people, you know, millions of views. It was awesome. And, and I'm making a ring. It was I was requested for a ringtone. So there'll be a ringtone soon for you can say good morning with my fucking insanity. <laughs> I'll donate all the money to the uh, my autism charity. How's that? Nice. Oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. Life's been good to me. By the way, I read your book since the last oh, time you were thanks, on. Man. Beautiful, great book, man. It's Thank awesome. Thank you very much, man. One Thank of the you. things that you mentioned in the book when we were talking about playing, you said that um, that the chords just kind of felt like you knew them when you first started. Yeah. It was, was like, you know, would you believe in reincarnation? 
Uh, you bring that you die and you can bring your talents with you. I mean, okay, I'm not going to get I, it. I don't care if I knew that. I'm just trying to, so I, you know, something. I was predicted before I was born. My mother, my mother's mother, my grandmother was a new ager before that was called new age. You know, she had psychic friends in the 50s and stuff like that when it's not cool. Mm -hmm. And they put their hand on my mother's 19 year old pregnant thing and said, ah, oh, it's a boy. It's going to be a musician. People know. My mother's like 19, a musician. Are you serious? A musician? You know, thinking it'll be like some junkie guy and get playing <laughs> jazz at a bar somewhere, which wasn't that far off. But uh, no, it's not a junkie. Uh, you know what I mean? It just, but I was struggling with it. You see the Beatles on the TV, and you go, "I want to do that. I got to make that sound." That George Harrison said, "How do you play chord?" You know, I got a guitar, and it was like terrible. You know, the strings were this far off the fucking neck. You know, forget about it. Right. So one day. I'm just sitting on the front porch and looking at it, and I made an E chord. I went playing. I went, what the fuck? I made a D chord, and I just got all the first position chords, a you know, all the one the folk chords, and it kind of freaked me out. I'm going, nobody was around, nobody showed me. It just happened. No, people are going bullshit. You know, okay, you can say that, but I'm telling you, that's what happened to me. And from then on. I was a sponge to everything. My ears opened up. I could pick things off the radio. I started hanging out with the teenagers. So I was always hanging out with older people than I probably when I shouldn't have, if you know what I mean? Yeah. I was exposed to a lot of interesting things and girls and smoking and drugs and booze and shit. I'm nine. The guys are 11. And then it turns into, you know, when we were kids. They start smoking weed and shit. Our parents had no idea, you know. Wow. Uh, yeah. Drinking Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill. Oh my God! That's who didn't? Who didn't have a good hurl on that? I mean, oh God! <laughs> the light of passage shit. You know what no, I mean? No, I remember Boone's Farm's crap, and then like uh, um, Peach mm -hmm. Schnapps. Well, I, oh I, yeah, I, I had a gag hurl on that one. Peach remember. Schnapps oh. and like Seven Up or something. It was like in the eighties. It ran out of booze. Yeah, that oh, man, you know. I don't. I don't regret. I mean, I do regret a lot of that fast shit. But hey. What doesn't kill you make you stronger, right? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, here's the next question from James Bonasisi. Bonasisi. Bonas Bonasisi. Yes. Did I get that, James? I hope so. <laughs> Thanks uh, for answering my question. Uh, just wanted to say the story about you and Jay Gro Graydon. Yeah, he was. Over over right? Yeah, he came over. He's Trevor's godfather. Oh, well. I got him out of the house first time since March, man. You know, he's he's agoraphobic, uh, I mean, agoraphobic and a germaphobe. Oh, man, this is a horrible time for him. Yeah, and he's always been that way. He's gotten worse. Like, you know, he, before this thing came out, he was walking around with gloves on and shit. But Jay is the real thing, man. There ain't nobody like him. And, yeah, I came up with the original piano riff. I sat down at the piano. Bah, 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 bah. I think we did a gag or something like that, and he had to go into the toilet, you know. So when Jay goes to the toilet, and he takes all of his clothes off. And I'm sitting there laughing, waiting for Champlin to show up. Now, I just started messing with the tune. And he comes out about a half hour later. He goes, hey, man, turn your love around. That's it. And, and we said, turn your love around. Then he came up with the aim under GF6 thing. That's and awesome. uh, that's how hit songs are made, kids. By accident. By fools like us. That's amazing. No, that's and then, they, then they dropped a garage band, and everybody's a record producer now. <laughs> Not quite. Uh, <laughs> well, no, I've heard in certain circles. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, last time we talked, you came out with a video with Ringo, which I did, which is a great, great video. Great yeah, story. thanks, man. It actually did really good. Still doing good, like four hundred thousand hits, and you know. We're, uh, we're having a laugh, and Joseph and I just wrote a new song for Ringo's record, where you just finished co-producing, or we're in the middle of it. We're uh, cutting my bits tomorrow, and Ringo and vocals and stuff on Monday and Tuesday. So that's very exciting. And then uh, Joe and I have uh, some new plans that will be uh, unleashed on the world very soon. And other than that, I'm just sitting around enjoying the time with my kids, you know, and my family and my girl. And... Um, I'm really, I'm really hoping the world doesn't go mad. You know what I mean? Whatever happened to the old peace and love? I know it's corny, but it's rather timely. It could be a, a good vibe to go. We've seen the other side. I agree with you. 
I agree with you. Uh, uh, would just be nice, just for a minute. Just yeah, just some peace and quiet. Oh, come on, man. Love. <laughs> Everybody needs a hug. Yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, Betty and Preston, Luke, my granddaughters and I met you in Philly last year when they presented a check of their contribution of one thousand to ALS in memory of Steve Picaro. It's actually Mike Picaro. Steve's still alive. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, well, for Autism Speaks, yes, that's a lovely thing to do. God bless you. You know, I'm sure that's going to help. Yeah. You get rid of that one. Autism, all those neurological things are. You need to erase them. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, agree. Well, I don't know if you know, but I, I'm in the healthcare industry and I do research in the pharmaceutical space. So uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're working on med good medications in that area. Oh, that's really yeah. helpful. I've heard good things, man. Yeah. ALS, ML. Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. That's I don't. That's the worst one I've ever seen. Yeah, it's ALS. Three, three friends die from it. Yeah. It's, and, the, and, it's the worst thing. I mean, I saw my father rot away from cancer, and this was just worse because it took longer. Right. It was more, more cruel. You know what I mean? And that's such really? a rare disease. Oh, like, I'm sick. Lights out. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. I'm fucked up. I don't want to go through this, man. Don't radiate me and make me fucking sick as a dog. So sick. I wish I was dead. You know what I mean? Come on. Right. If right. I got if I got the dose, if somebody said, hey, you know what? It's there's nothing we can do, man. If I was you, I'd just be comfortable. Boy, if it, after you get over the initial shock and all that goes with it, I would just say, you know what, man? I'm going to Hawaii or somewhere and I'm going to rent a beach house and open up the thing. And I want to, you know, the, the fat guy for the saying the uh, somewhere over the rainbow is dead. So we need somebody like that, you know, just kind of play the ukulele somewhere over the rainbow and just keep me really fucking high looking at the ocean with all my loved ones around me. And I just say goodbye to everybody. And I go, okay, lights out. Let's do it. Yeah. I think that would just be the right way to go, man. I mean, if there's no hope. Yeah. Why does it have to be, let's tear this person asunder before we bury him? I mean, every person I've ever known that's had cancer and died, man, it's like they wish at the end, like, they should have just done me in the in the beginning. Right. Yeah, you should have just I'm gone not off fucking and better. Me. This sucked. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not yeah. taking that shit. I know it's easy for me to say because I'm healthy, but I, right. should, I shouldn't be. I got lucky. God gave gave it back to me for being good behavior. Where was right. behavior? Is anybody is anybody here? Did, did I steal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, was, when was your good behavior? That's what he said. When was your good I cleaned up. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> uh, we got another one uh, from I IIF Boston. Thank you very much, and thanks everybody. Can read, uh, okay, you like to read? I can read it too. No, if you can read it, bad. Uh, no, go ahead. Read it for the for the feed. Okay, <laughs> Steve, you mentioned liking Jeff Coleman's distortion pedal. Are you familiar with Cosmo Squad? His band. Yes, I am both, and I'm a huge fan of Jeff Coleman. What an unbelievably great guitar player! The great, great guy. Guitar player. And uh, he turned me on to one of his pedals, and it's one of the only things that actually works the way I play. It's so smooth, and it can handle high gain. And he laid it onto me, and it's my one of my favorite pedals, man. I mean, really is. And uh, I recommend it to people that like to play and get a little bit more tubbiness to a, a, a say a solo or something like that. I, uh, some people don't like to fly that uh, that much high gain into them, but sometimes it's fun. Yeah. His pedal was really friendly with that and also without it. I mean, just a great sounding pedal. He, he, he knows Tone. He's a really, really good guy. Check out that band. Killer. Yeah, they're great. That's cool. Uh, Jose Benito Martinez Jr.? Hey. Wow, long. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, was Radio Top 40 important in your early days? And did you listen to Boss Radio KHJ Los Angeles? I did. I did. I was weaned on it. My mother was 19 when she had me. So she was listening to pop music. So I was weaned on KHJ in the Valley. First time our, our first single came on, which actually came out today, 42, 43 years ago or something. Here. Oh, really? Uh, wow. The line came out today. It was on KHJ. And I thought, wow, I actually fucking I made it. <laughs> What was the first thing on that? When you play your stuff on, on, your, on your local radio station, is when it sort of hits home. You're in the car and you know your friends are listening to it and they call you and go, Hey, man, you're on the radio. That's a pretty cool feeling. What song was that? Hold the Line. 
Oh, hold the line. Yeah, that's a huge song. Back in 1928 when I recorded that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just a fetus at the time. Oh, that's so funny. You know, when you said you had a 45-year career, 45 year career so far, I'm like, shit, I've known you like 32 years of it. Really? <laughs> Where did it go, man? <laughs> I remember you at Bradshaw's place, man. What was that? I it was at Broward, oh, yeah. It was it Broward's? We were yeah, at Broward's. 1987. 1987. So. Yeah, that was heady times. When I started working there. And like, then, you was a baby. Bob. then you used to work for Bob. No, I never worked for Bob. That's a misconception. Oh, really? That's a misconception. Uh, misconception. I didn't work for Bob. Uh, oh, I worked at Andy Brower and making music. I think I confused it with the Brower shit, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, that's no problem. People mistake me all the time. So I, I um I don't know if you if this will be a good question for you or not, but do you have still have any of your rack gear? Yeah, it's all it's all in the uh, the stuff that I actually used is in the vaults, you know, or not the vaults, you know, my, where I keep my storage place. Right. Oh, that's cool. Well, no, the- I a lot of that. I mean, I have a lot, a lot of the early stuff. Yeah, some of it got stolen from Browers. Hmm. <laughs> I'm all my original, like you know, I had the original pedals, uh, like the uh, Ibanez tube screamers. Mm-hmm. They came and gave me three of them before they even gave them to Stevie Ray Vaughan. And in that, those got stolen. I had all my original MXR pedals gone. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, I just like, I was there in 87. I don't remember any of that shit there at that time. When yeah, I had two, two C12s, matching C12s, uh, stereo M50 gone, amp lamps, uh, boutique amps that people laid on me gone. Hmm. No. Hmm. You know, I don't know where it went. Just God. Neither, neither does anybody else. <laughs> yeah. I bet I know where they went. Yeah, I, I hope they didn't go up somebody's nose. That would really piss me off. Well, I might have. Anyway, how about the dodge? I'm gonna keep fucking with my hair right now. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's fake anyway. See? Nah. That was right. Right. See? Anyway, I look like a mad fucking professor. <laughs> Jesus, I'm not high or anything, man. I'm just being in a weird mood today. That's cool. All right. What's Pretty going cool. on? All right. Well, we've got – this is a question I wanted to ask you last time. So, Adam, thank you. Steve, can you talk for a second about Jeff and what it felt like to play with him? Any story or thought would be welcome, and thanks for all you've done. Uh, yeah, we didn't talk about Jeff, and I Jeff was a – He was I, so special that I, it's hard to put that into words, really, because he was born with something you just don't learn. You don't, You can't learn it. You come in with it. I just remember hearing him playing with them for the first time in, in the family house, you know, when we were in high school, you know, playing in Steve, Steve's band. And uh, Jeff would come in and, and jam with us once in a while. I mean, he was just walking in the room. It was like the room lit up. I mean, you knew he was special. You just knew he was special, man, and he was. But he was very patient and cool, and he was like the coolest guy I ever knew. And I miss him every day. He was the greatest group drummer of all time, as far as I'm concerned in my yeah yeah he's so, just, i mean there's a lot of greats and i played with most of them you know i've been blessed to do that but jeff was just had something that just connected with my soul you know yeah he taught me all about where the groove was at so in the pocket yeah. good. And, and he could really play behind closed doors he'd start playing some shit i go why don't you ever play that in front of people they get mad at me <laughs> i fucked that shit oh man <laughs> I remember doing. Uh, as well I remember as well. doing your cartage on many sessions with Jeff. I remember Jeff distinctly. Mm-hmm. I always remember Jeff out back before the session, oh, yeah. smoking a little something, and then uh, you know going oh. on the session. And uh, he was always a, just such a cool cat, great guy. Yeah, I miss. It's been almost thirty years, man. Yeah, wow. hey, you go. Oh, incredible! Just incredible. I'm sure he's right too. I. I mean, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. As I turn to my 63rd birthday this month, yikes. Yeah. yeah. Where'd it go, man? It was like Blink. I was 19 years old in the studio's Blink. It's, I mean, here, four kids and great woman looking after me, a great new dog. 
I still got a career when they turn the lights back on. I got a record coming out with Joseph. And we both have different solo records coming out on the same label, the same day in February. And we got some some surprises coming up before the end of the year. And hey, man, making the most of the time off. And I really hope everybody's doing well out there because I hear a lot of people aren't. We're doing donating some you know money and time and doing some charity things to help you know, you know the people behind the scenes that don't really get any help. Yeah, that's very nice. A lot of people are doing positive things, and I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's that, and then otherwise, I'm just I'm booking as if we're still going to work next year. But I've also made it so that we can book to 2022. We'll take the same shows, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad yeah. you're going to be booking. I, you got to keep pushing straight ahead. I mean, we don't really know if it's going to happen, but um, you got to be prepared because um, you never know. There might be a cure all of a sudden, or some way to get around it. Right. Yeah. Are you uh, when you say you're booking stuff for next year? Is that for solo or is that with? Uh, well, it's something you know. You'll you'll find out. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm also supposed to go out with Ringo next year too. So that's what I was saying. Yeah. Like to work. Um, I'm not sure the May June one's going to happen. I hope so, but that's being pretty uh, mm, hopeful. Yeah. Uh, but he but there's one in the fall too so i mean i really miss being on the road you know but uh, but i have to be honest i mean in my particular situation you know as you know yeah sure it gets boring sometimes and all that but we've tried to make the most of it and and the the time i've had with my families and with my new girlfriend for almost a year has been priceless you know and me settling down and eating right sleeping right you know spending really quality time with my kids at least I can. I'm one of the lucky guys that could could do that and enjoy it and not live in fear. For those who are struggling out there, God bless you, man. Hang tough. You know, there it's going to end, man. Everything ends. Even the bubonic plague ended. You know, mm -hmm. exactly. Exactly. Eventually, it'll end. Um, hey, we missed a super chat. Um, I don't see it in the the chat thing in the discussion but he uh, says and thanks bv for telling me it says mark uh steve is a 14 year old viewer patrick uh let me see patrick riley hey, patrick. Uh, hi steve i am um 14 i'd love your stuff a lot do you remember how you practice when you were a teenager ferociously yeah because it, you know it wasn't like today there wasn't any outside distractions you either were listening to the new record of the day hanging out with your buddies rehearsing with your band or you're at home learning stuff off of records trying to be better than the next guy i used to play a lot with michael landau because we grew up together we met when we were 12 and we used to practice together a lot and played in lots of bands together and he was amazing then too so we were like the two guys in town and we became best friends and we still are and but yeah playing was something that you it was all about playing didn't want to do anything but play mm -hmm. Or the idiots, <laughs> one of the two. And that was usually for Friday and Saturday nights. But uh, no, man, we all talked about music. We studied music. We were you know, studying privately. We went to the Dick Grove School the first year. We were taking every music class in, in high school, which is shameful that it's not there anymore because it was the only classes that I would go to. And um, I learned a lot there. And the, even the most basic stuff, basic harmony and theory, sight singing, piano, you know, hand and exercises and all that stuff. Dumb shit, really, but really helpful. It's good to know the dumb stuff. It really is. It helps you in ways that you won't even understand it until you get into it. So, you know, just enjoy it and soak it all in, and you'll just find like-minded people that want to hang with you, and you learn off of them, and who knows what comes from that. Right. You you said a key thing, though. You, you played with people. Yeah. You got to play with people, man. You got to play with people to understand. We, this came up the other day um, with uh, my longtime friend Jamie Kime. Hello, like, Jamie. What a great player! And and uh, he's like, yeah, man. Like most of these people, like a lot of the people that I was teaching and stuff, it, they never they came and they never played with the, a band. They've never played with people. Well, they they could competently play guitar, but they don't understand the interaction of a band and the interaction between musicians and and improv improvisation and and all that see to me that's how i started you know yeah. started fun. oh you play drums okay let, let's just you and me we'll get together and play you know make racket in the room that looks it sounds like music until it does sound like music 
But that's the key factor. I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, if everybody's just sitting in front of the computer learning the hot licks of the day, it's like you're learning to sprint before you can crawl. Right. You know, you got to be able to play a pocket. Otherwise, no matter how much you shred and blow people's minds, which is cool, but if you can't groove, I mean, all the greats groove. I mean, are you, Eddie Van Halen, come on. No. Oh, we're in that groove. I have Steve Stevens, you know, uh, you know, guys that play rhythm guitar, but they play tough, they play hard. There's a lot of them. Those are the cats. You know, you got to play with a drummer, even if you're floating with the time. You don't have to work, click, click, you know, get to the click track shit later. Just play with other people and maybe create group time. You find a couple of guitar players and a bass player and a drummer, and you get in a room and you play a tune you all pick and struggle through it until it sounds like a tune. Yeah. That's how it starts. You don't, you're, you're supposed to suck when it starts. Don't be discouraged. That's you know, true. you learn how to play in tune and time and look at each other and, you know, listen to where the you know, song goes, the song structures. Listen to what the other guy plays, and then you start going, oh, that's how it works. You'll find it on your own. That self-discovery is way more valuable than learning the lick of the day. Do that, too, but play with people and use it. Then you'll go, oh, okay, I see how it works. And then you find your own stuff. And mm -hmm. Great advice. Trial and error. You have, you know, you, you know, don't be afraid to fail. I fail, and I still do. I've been playing my whole life. Great, great. I, only now I laugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we missed a super chat also. Um, uh, Hudson Olowski, he says, Steve, in my humble opinion, you're the greatest session guitarist of all time. I, I know you'd humbly disagree. What, who do you think is the greatest? Ooh, the greatest? I mean, you know, that's that's a... Or session guy, session... Well, yeah, but I'm saying there's so many great... I mean, you go to Tedesco, you go to Dean Parks, you go, you know, I mean, uh, what, what generate, you know, the Wrecking Crew guys, or do we go later, like Larry and Lee mm. and Braden and all those guys, and then Ray Parker, then me, then Mike Landau, then Mike Thompson and Tim Pierce and all the other guys that do stuff that I don't know because I'm right. old and I don't keep up with everybody's shit anymore. <laughs> Yeah, well, Tim. I mean, look at this hair. Do you think that I've actually like care about it? I'm, I keep I'm mentioning because I'm looking at myself, going, "Jesus, you look like an idiot." <laughs> <laughs> this is what being locked up looks like, kids. <laughs> it's not that bad. Care. I haven't, I haven't worn it's shoes. real. It's real. I haven't worn shoes in six months. <laughs> <laughs> and now I know I have Neanderthal feet. <laughs> Club feet. Um, hey, uh, Dave, this is a question for Dave. Dave, I picked up a JJ Jr. I'm using a Golden Pearl to boost. Any suggestions on what clipping to use? Trying to get heavy on the JJ but clear. Uh, what the amp doesn't do it? Use it on the JB mode on the amp. It should be pretty heavy. I would. Gary can't tell. It's reasonably heavy. <laughs> yeah, it's got enough gain on tap. You should be fine. Yeah, or the Golden Pearl is great to boost it a little if you want. And here's the uh, the super chat from Hudson. Thank you, by the way. Um, I think I missed uh, somebody. Pete Thorne else. super chat. Pete Thorne. I, I'm, starting to, I'm starting to look weirder and weirder. It's great, man. <laughs> <laughs> keep messing with it. It keeps getting bigger. I'm enjoying myself. Sad. Nobody's paying me to be here, man. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's up? Pete Thorne, pre preamps, rack gear, and power amps versus heads and pedal board. You've used both to great effect. Advantages and dis disadvantages of both. Oh, thanks for the love, Pete. I think really the the, the days of the rack gear, it's impossible and you know, not affordable to take it on the road. And it, 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 it's a, it was a great moment in history, you know, that I get blamed for all the time. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of people love that sound and we gave it to them, you know, I mean, th they requested all this stuff, you know, I have to say that it was probably Landau that started with the tri-stereo chorus and that became a thing. And when I, when I did that Starlix video, which was like, you know, herpes, I can't get rid of it. Um, <laughs> I, I had just gotten this stuff, you know, and I crawled into this Starlix thing. What is this? How am I supposed to do it? They played this track and I started, I just turned everything on because it was new. 
So, you know, you know, all these years later, it sounds like so, I wonder if somebody writers, they said it sounded like a kazoo, which made me laugh so hard because that's what it does sound like. But, you know, I, you know, we weren't like going for the tone king at the time. It was like, what am I going to play this lick and all this? Stuff. It was the first one of its kind. So I kind of look really stupid in it and now, like, you know, 35, 40 years later as an age well. Um, and neither of us. That's, that's a legendary video, though. Come on. This is this is me sober, so you can only imagine. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm somebody's dad. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it was a thing. You know, everybody had it. I'm not. I was. I was. You know, Mike. Mike was using. And Buzzy Feetin was the first one I saw, and then I saw Mike's and I heard Mike's and I said, "Shit!" I, I was on a session with him. I said, "I gotta have that. That's amazing." You know the you know the delays going and everything like it. I had to, I said I said make me what Mike has, but he couldn't because it's, I used different amps and stuff like that. But it was it was it was a fun toy. It was like going through I you know. It was a phase in life, you know. I used to be the just plug into a deluxe reverb, and if I doubled it, I doubled it, and I didn't use anything, you know. Right. Right. I used the Les Paul, which I still have my fifty nine burst. But as things got a little bit more high tech especially the 80s with all the all the synth pop they want all that trick shit you know mm -hmm. they love the jangly choruses and they love the delays and the the wash of it all and uh you know so we did what we were told i mean you have to understand as a session player they they ask you what they tell you what they want and they expect you to give it so you got to have all the gear to please them and they would ask you up front do you have the bradshaw stuff man you, you got all that stuff in there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. And then you use it. So, you know, you play it on a hit records playing that, and people go, Oh, that's Luke with sound. I go, Oh, thanks a lot. You know, I mean, it's like if I was starring in a, in a play wearing a dress, I'd have to wear a dress all the time. I mean, I have to laugh at it now, but I mean, come on, man. It was a long time ago. Well, now your setup's a lot more simpler. It's just a cat. Well, I mean, to answer Pete's question, I went back to pedals because I it got a little scary to be away from home and not have anybody be able to fix it right away. And and if it's just a pedal, you rip it up, take it down. And I just I, I became too paranoid about it. And unless I had Bob on the road, which is hard to do because he has a big business, I just wanted to do fly dates and stuff. It's not you got too expensive. You, know, you can't take that stuff with you. Mm -hmm. So I had to fight, figure out a new way. So I did. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, I still love my Bob Bradshaw stuff. It still works. I've been offered a lot of money for it, but I'm not selling it. Not now, anyway. I'm, I can imagine it's worth a lot of money. Yeah, it has a kitschy value. It's like, oh, there's the guy that, you know, I mean, I played on all those records and all that stuff. Uh, and this is the gear. But, you know, it's like if I play Eddie Van Halen's guitar, I just, I just sound like me playing the guitar. You right. know what I mean? I, it doesn't, I don't all of a sudden switch into Eddie Van Halen super mode. You know what I mean? It's, I wish. But, uh, you know, there's no magic guitar. But people still like to have ownership of stuff and say, it's like in my studio, I have some faders from the Neve that were in the, you know, that did Dark Side of the Moon. So I think there's a mojo in there. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Right. I want to put my guitar through those two channels. Of course. Because Dave Gilmore did, you know. Is that is that your phone, Dave, or yours, Luke? Yes, it is, and I'm sorry for that. Oh, if you don't mind, if you can, because uh, someone's going to write me and be like, no. Well, don't. Yeah, I was going to your house. house. Come to your house and stay a while. You won't dig it. I'm a pain in the ass. Unfucking believable, ass. Uh, Mark I, 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 so you're the guy that took that. I tried to get that name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, Dave, and Luke need your T-shirt sizes coming soon, just to give back to my heroes. Luke, Luke's ultimate tone and how to achieve it. Oh, I'll die trying. I'll die. <laughs> yeah, every, you know, I got to try everything. You know, right now I'm trying another little thing, and I don't know. Uh, it depends on what the day is. I mean, I, I hate, people are starting to sound the same, so I'm I'm trying to run away from that a little bit. I mean, technique-wise, you can't get any faster. It's like it's almost you got to pull back. Playing slow is cool now because it's gotten so insane that it, it's like you see that, <laughs> you hear that? Yeah, <laughs> and, didn't see it. <laughs> really? Imp oh shit! The fucking phone don't stop. <laughs> no problem. Fuck off. <laughs> I'm sorry if I swear, everybody. It's just you know. Oh, no, you can swear on here. It's a, it's all good. Uh, Michael Nielsen, 
No, wow. Uh, yeah, the robot guitar. I still have the one and only yes, even though somebody made them and I don't make any money off of it. I don't know. Well, the body, I mean, it's funny that the neck, it was a 63 um, fender neck that they retooled to their headstock and we repainted it. It used to be that mahogany um, EMG strat that I had. We repainted, we sanded it down and repainted that and put some different pickups in it. And put the artwork. The artwork came from a guy. I forgot. I forget his name. It was a one-off. I just said, do some wacky. So that would be. I would say 1984, 85, because that's when guys started painting their guitars, or whatever. So I got that one guitar, and, I, and it just ended up being the one I used for a really long time. I still have it. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to sell it. That's cool. I mean, one of these days, I might bring out all my old guitars and just for for the laugh, play it for whatever song from, from that history. You know. I don't know if it'll make much difference, but hey, might make the guitars more valuable for when I die and leave this shit to my kids. It would, and it'd be nice to just see the history. Yeah. Uh, Davy C, uh, I own a Loop 3. Thanks for the super chat, by the way. The neck profile is rather lean and amazingly easy to play. Did you design that, or was it presented to you? Well, uh, they, they, they know what I like from the first neck that I ever gave them. Um, and they make different size necks. Uh, no, no two are the same, but I prefer an easy neck to play. I mean, I've had, I've got injuries on both rotator cuffs, so it's, I, you know, things are different than they used to be. You know what I mean? I'm not a young man anymore, so I need a little help. You know what I mean? Oh, look at that! See, I'm very excited about this man. They're doing really, really well. People seem to really be excited about the way they sound and play. So. They're, they're great guitars. The only, the only suggestion is just make a lefty. That's all I can ah, say. Well, you know what? They, you know, there has to be a, a you know, they have to That's get a few people who want them to, to, to retool the whole place to make a lefty, you know? I know. I know. And it's a drag. That must be horrible for you, man. It's, it's not, it's not fun. But uh, yeah. most, most, most companies make stuff. But uh, I wanted one of your models, but they don't make it a lefty, unfortunately. But well, these are great. Well, you know, I'll have to have a word with you. Yeah. Let's, let's take one. Nice black lefty. Yeah, something. You know? Make one. We know someone will buy it. I know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. And if you don't buy it, he's going to go, hey, man, the guitar's on its way to your house. You owe me money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be great. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yo, from Purposeful Porpoise. Yo, Dave, would it be possible to get a mini Dirty Shirley in the black and gold plexi color scheme? Also, well, the first answer to that, and we'll get to the second one, Dave. Sure. Could do it. Okay. Oh. And Luke, can you talk about the gig with EVH at the Baked Potato? Oh. Well, I would, I would never call that fusion, man. That was just a... I was there. Were you there? Yeah. Oh, my Lord. That was such overkill, man. That was way overkill. We had like six twelves <laughs> on oh, top God. of our racks, okay? Me, Eddie, and Mike Lando. Yeah, and Will Lee was there, and Carlos Vega. Mm -hmm. Creechy, was Creechy there? Uh, I think so. so. And Lenny, I think Lenny was there. And Eddie made it through the first set. I mean, you know, we wrote Fuck Snot was the name of the band. We wrote it outside, and you know, people <laughs> were offended by it, of course. And uh, it was just for a, a lark. You know, I just played, you know, songs from our garage band youth, you know. Over you know, just to blow minds at the baked potato, man. You know what I mean? Four thousand people in the streets they hear about it, you know, it turns into a big stick. And Ed's, you know, we were all wild back then, you know, and Ed couldn't hang, it just got too intense for him. He ran up to my house and uh waited for me to come home. <laughs> yeah, um, you know that the baked potato's been the been the home of many a wild night. <laughs> Like, the beginning of a wild week. Uh, no. Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, oh, God. Oh, uh, wow. Whew. I haven't thought about that in a long time. But those were fun days, man. <laughs> hey, Dave, I know um, you want to talk about the uh, that amp. Which what? one? Uh, Re Rivera amp. Uh, yeah, uh, tell us about your Rivera experience with your bonehead amp. Yeah, well, you know, well, all good things come uh, to an end. <laughs> no good, uh, no good deed goes unpunished. I came up with the idea for a, uh, you know, to do a 
what about a guitar player? We'll all, especially during the grunge era, whenever he's tuning down, you know, get, you know, get a subwoofer for a fucking guitar, and mm -hmm. you can dial in just how much you want. Just to add a little more heaviness, because you know, after when you start tuning down to C, you can't hear anything. You fly, it flops out. So I, I said, Bill, that I'll I'll split it with you 50-50. So he did, I mean, it worked, and it was cool. And uh, I used it, and um, we were still working on the gain structure. I wanted more gain, and um, it never really got off the ground, really, you know. And, and then I found out that he patented. And left me off the patent really hurt my feelings man i didn't get that you know it's it was a real you know, low low blow to me and then you know but it just and uh the relationship ended poorly i'm sorry about that oh that's crazy i didn't know that wow. yeah you know though i'm getting old i might as well tell the truth you know i don't yeah. i don't wish anybody harm it just you know one of those things. It, 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 it was supposed to be on the level, you know. I've known yeah. the guy a long time. Hurt my feelings. The stories of Ed and Floyd Rose and all that stuff. Oh God, I, I've heard that same kind of scenario. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, never miss. It's really tough. Not never, but it's really tough to mix friendship and business. Do you believe, with Dave? Do you believe that story about Ed and Floyd Rose? What's yeah, I. I, I, I I think uh, I think he helped develop the fine tuners. I, I think absolutely makes sense. I be, I believe it. Mm -hmm. He was one of the biggest users of that thing in the in the beginning, and I got number three. Yeah, you know. Wow. So, well, did yours have yours? Didn't have fine tuners. Steve. That was when it was difficult. Right. That was hard, man. That's so hard to get in tune and lock it down, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. pull it good. sharp. Because you know, yeah. right, right. Once it was in, you could chuck it around the room, man. It was really something else. That's how I got that Cheech and Chong movie. I just got it and I was showing it to him, man. He said, Hey, man, can we record some of that? <laughs> That's what's in the movie. So awesome. I got paid for that. That was, I got paid great for that, as a matter of fact. Those guys are great. That was fun. <laughs> That's fantastic. Hey, um, when I went, went through your book, there were a lot of uh, sessions and things mm -hmm. that, we, that we didn't talk about last time. And I was just curious if you can touch on some of the things. Sure. That on. Um, Diana Ross. Can we talk about that? I don't think we talked about Diana Ross last time. Ms. Ross. Um, how, how was that working with her? I mean, well, she wasn't there. They had a sing like. Uh, that was one of the first sessions I did for Richard Perry. Jeff, Jeff Picard called me. I was still living with my parents. He goes, get over here. Be Man, good. Like, you get over here and be good. <laughs> like, something like that. And I cruised. I was like, wow, this is a real session. It was like, and I was in there and I did good, I guess. Played simple. I played, you know, just what they wanted. Nothing, nothing to write home about. But I was, you know, that was my early days as a session guy. And Jeff, for Jeff to recommend me and I did good. So it made him look good. And they called me back to work and some more stuff on the record. Then started hiring me for other sessions and word of mouth, man. I just, and you know, guys were moving up, and there was a slot for me, you know. Right. Jake Raiden was going to production. Lee Rittenauer was going to be a solo artist, you know. So there was a slot for me. And Jay yeah. turned me on to all the work he, he, you know, he couldn't do. And just, he hired me for all the sessions, and he's still my one of my closest friends. And he was my big mentor to me, sonically and everything. Like, you know, he got me into the orange squeezer on the 335 and all that stuff, you know. Yeah, I used to, I, I, I wish I had. I have the, the 335, sure, but some of the, you know, those old little amps and little mm. gadgets, you know, from the old days, you can't get anymore. Oh, well, you can get them. They just got to pay more expensive. <laughs> right. Got to pay big, uh, big money. Um, Olivia Newton John, of who I had. Well, like, yeah. uh, uh, you um, know, uh, God bless her, man. She's She's having a tough time right now, from what I hear. Oh, no. When I met her, man, I was like 19 and she was like in her, at her hottest. I mean, you know, she was just in her 20s, just going, oh, oh, oh. oh my God, I couldn't. It, 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 she was so beautiful, it was distracting. <laughs> so nice, too. That was even worse. You know, you just <laughs> you fell in love with her. You're like in the nicest way, not in a nasty way, but uh, she's like, oh, she's like the most beautiful girl you ever saw. And so nice and bubbly and all that. See, that was all real. And you want to play good for her because she sang so great in the phones, you know. 
Right. And John Farrar was kind enough to hire me that for that and hired me for the next couple. And then I ended up on the legendary Let's Get Physical. How about that? <laughs> the biggest song of the MT, MTV year 1981, I guess. That's that's incredible. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, Cheap Trick. Did we talk about that last time, Dave? Did no, I, play, I played the guitars on a song called Voices on the Dream Police album. Didn't get any credit, but, you know... I got a gold, I got a gold pick and I got a platinum record. That's cool. How did that come about? Just they came to you. I mean, they just called me. I mean, they don't need me. Rick Nielsen's great guitar. Player. I was gonna say, yeah. Why? Why? Just any particular. I think they wanted something different, man. I, and they they had ringers on earlier albums. I think Jay Graydon played on one of their albums. Played a rockabilly solo. They wanted something different. I don't know why they do that. I mean, as producers and songwriters, maybe they themselves said, "I'm not right for this." Right. I'm, I've often said that. I said, I'm not right for this, man. I'm gonna let Landau do this, you know. Especially when you're working with two guitar players, you can read each other, you know. Right, 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 right. I'm certainly not part of the cheap trick sound by any means, but I I'm very honored to be part of that uh, you know, huge record for them. You know, it's a legend yeah. album for them. Massive. Um the author author I can't even say it, Arthur's theme from Christopher Cross. Um, <laughs> what do you want? You know, read the part. Michael Lamarty, read the part. Um, I don't know if I played electric or acoustic on that. I think I played electric, and I was I didn't have a lot of parts in it. I just you don't really got, hear a lot of guitar in there, so I was curious. Yeah, there's not. There's, you know, and they, they didn't turn them up. You know? Yeah. And that's their right as a producer, but I was I was on it. That's I mean, I can hear, I, if I really go like this, I can hear a little bit, but, you know. Right. And then the, uh, the song um, Just Once with Quincy that you did. I mean, that was huge. That yeah, was that was that, that was just a chord sheet, man. I came up with those parts myself, and that was the first thing I ever did for Quincy. And that was also coincidentally the first thing that James Ingram ever sang for Quincy. So we were both like, you know, the young kids on the streets. I was in the early twenties, you know. Uh, David Foster turned me on to that. He, he took on to Quincy. So thanks uh, to him for that. And we, Quincy took a shine to me, man. I did all the stuff after that, you know. Yeah, that dude album. So the whole dude all of a sudden you know, looking at this, you know, two feet away from Stevie Wonder, you know, I'm like, uh, I better play good today, you know. Wow. And so, that, that was a trip, you know, that was just uh, really wonderful experiences, you know. And uh, Q took a real shine, and I and he to this day, there's always a good vibe when I see him. I mean, uh, played on a lot of hits for, for him, yeah. It's it's wild though. Why did he come out with a solo album, Quincy? As opposed he always to had solo albums, and, and he's the only one that never plays on them. You know, he farms it out, you know, and he, and he, and he it's most definitely a Quincy Jones record. Wow. He, he's like a great casting director, man. He just knows how to get his sound because he knows the right guys to give him the sound that he's hearing in his head. Right. right. Like, you know, he'd know what the difference whether to hire me or David Williams or somebody like that, you know. He no, 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 let's, let's, you know, he, Get the right guys for the right parts. I remember David Williams. Yeah. <laughs> the character. Cool character. Good guy. He lived yeah. life. You know, he, you know, he lived a crazy life. Man. He lived a crazy life. Lived it kind of hard towards the end. Yeah. yeah. He went to he went to Nam, man. <laughs> no one's ever the same when they go to Nam. Hmm. He told me some stories that were pretty fucking holy shit, you know. Yeah. My uncle, that was never the same. You know? like, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, this is a question for Dave. Could you think of, uh, could you think you could ever make an SS100 in a combo, maybe a 50 watt or 25 watt, and still sound good? It'd be huge if it was 100 watt. Well, I could make it sound good. I don't know if I'm ever going to do it, but I can make it sound good. Could maybe do something custom. Okay. You know, it costs uh, some money. Cost money. <laughs> Night Mission. Uh, Luke, I'll Be Over You is a song that touched a moment in my life forever. I love you for that song. Uh, uh, well, love you back. That's so so cool. It's funny. Uh, the, the weirdest guy like me, like, you know, writes the cheesiest love songs, you know. I have a heart. I do. You're emotional. I am. Rick Bowden. Uh, Luke, what... What's a piece of gear you wish you could have again? Guitar, pedal, etc. Ooh, it have to be a tie. My gold top and that red guitar, the 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 one Schecter red that I 
some a Japanese guy offered me so much money for this shit. And I'm like, you know, I had a daughter in college at the time. And I was like, I haven't played this guitar in 10 years. Now I look back and go, shit, why did I sell that gold top, you know? Well, it's a time. I, well, I still got the 59 Burst and the 51 Esquire and the 335 and all the, some of the other little weird guitars and robots and all those early shit that uh, Sunburst Valley Arts I had. And I still have that one, number three. What year was Gold Top? Gold Top went to some Japanese cat, man. No, what year was the uh, guitar? 50. It was a 58. Oh, wow. It was one of the PAFs on it. It was banged up real good, too. And I used it a bunch on the second album um, and the first tour. And then I, I started collecting guitars, and Paul Jamison actually got me into it. Yeah. Yo, Jamo. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Jamo. And then you played on Chicago, uh, Hard to Say I'm Sorry, which was a huge. Yeah. yeah I think they forgot about me. <laughs> you no know credits? Well, you know, man, you know, what can I say? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there were some credits, I guess. I'm sure there was many sessions with no credits. Oh, I did I did some under the table, can't tell you stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of this guy, a lot of us guys did stuff, you know, that like would really surprise people. I yeah. can't say, I can't say, you know. Where were you playing on an Alice Cooper? Session? I did. Early yeah. on, early on, man. It was, it's a complex. I got to write with uh, Bernie Thompson and Alice. Mm -hmm. And Foster brought me in because he didn't know nothing about rock and roll. Uh, and, and so I was a punk ass kid, 19 years old. I'm like, God, I get to write songs pretty top. And now this is the coolest thing ever. And we all got together. Alice Cooper, man, this is the coolest thing ever. And we hit it off and I did the whole record. And Keith Olson was engineering. And Keith and I hit it off. We did a bunch of records together. Um, I had a fabulous experience during that. I got to co-write some songs. And Rick, that's where I met Rick Nielsen. He played on one of my songs. And... I don't know. I had a gas. They, it was a time for me to stretch out, and they featured me on a lot of stuff. And, you know, all that stuff is when I'm starting to make a name for myself. It's like, you know, it was real good for the career. And they had a top 10 single off that album. That's awesome. Uh, Pete, Horn. Pete, you don't have to keep giving uh, super chats, man. Just text me. <laughs> um, Pete, Pete, Pete what, do you, what do you want for that $10? That's what I, I was going to know. <laughs> Uh, can you tell us about working with Henley? I uh, yeah. I had to learn your dirty laundry solo as well as Walsh's for my first audition with him. Mind blowing solo you played. Oh shit! I'm sorry about that. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I was just, we were there to to play on uh, "You Better Hang Up," you know, which is another song off that album. Is double drums with Henley and Jeff, and uh, Cooch was uh, producing, and and uh, Ladani. It was just like it was the the heyday and i was there playing and we got the track and uh i think so ladani or, or cooch said we should have luke on one of the solos on dirty laundry and jeff's like yeah man do it and so they put it up and um they gave me the solo at the end they played me the middle solo with joe i was really psyched to be on a record with joe wallace one of my all-time heroes you know now honored to say a friend but um you know, I'm stoked, Joe Walsh. Wow, Don Henley. Fuck, I mean, I'm in the middle of all this. You know what I mean? So I knew, uh, and Jeff was there. It was a moment in time, and it was like, I had to go for it. And Ladani uh, dialed in a monster tone, and I just uh, stepped on the gas, man, and, and it was there. And I, I went for it. I think I made one little mistake at the end, and I punched it in. But otherwise, it was one take. And they just kept going with it, you know. And then, and then... I don't know what happened. I mean, I heard they went through a couple of versions, but they kept the solos or whatever, you know. <laughs> but that was that was that. I was just thrilled. I mean, it was such a great tune. I remember, you know, when he was just writing the lyrics and everything. We were just sitting in the room. Jeff threw out a couple of gems that I think he used a couple of them, and it was really fun. Dom was really having a good time. It was his first solo album, you know. Mm -hmm. It was like he was hanging with different guys that were just loose and. I just remember doing my first solo album like that, going, wow, this is just different. You know, you, you get to do it however you want to do it. You know, you don't have to compromise anything. Although, you know, there's something to be said about compromise. You know? I'm, try I'm trying to make my hair as weird as I can. Throughout the 
<laughs> You're getting close. You're doing good. You're doing that Dewey Cox thing, you know? <laughs> I think if you let it all, go all gray, it would be really interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not all the way there yet. See, I, I'm looking at it. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm really lazy at home during this COVID shit, right? <laughs> it's got a little bit of Kramer going on. Yeah, I got a little Kramer thing going on there, but that, yeah. I'm, I actually have that in my personality. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, sans the rant on, uh, you know, uh, my, my uh, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> Roy Batty, thank you for the super chat. Steve, you mentioned MXR pedals. What were your favorite pedals? Dave, can you rec recommend a good pedal board power supplies? Well, of course, the Freeman one. Yeah. Uh, well, I, mean, I had the first run. The first run of them were like, wow, what's all this stuff? You know, what does a Dynacomp do? You know, yeah. And then you get the graphic equalizer and you mess around with that and you kick it on for a solo or something like that. And you, you, they just had some interesting stuff, you know, and that, they were the first of their kind, as far as I remember. I mean, and, and, and you know, I had the real raw Gibson fuzz tone and stuff like that way back, you know, mm -hmm. like the one they used on Satisfaction. You know? Yeah, you had the boss tone that you plug into the guitar. Remember the father, the, mm -hmm. the Fender boss tone, you know. So I go way, way, way back with all this stuff. First <laughs> wah wah pedals and everything like that. Yeah, I was all in. Remember the first phase shifter? Mike Landau had the first phase shifter when I said, Wow, wow, that's pretty cool. Was that MXR? Who had the first? No, that was, that, that was the, the next company. And then all of a sudden, they started making effects for guitars and it started to go crazy. Nah. And uh, now look at what, what, where it's at, you know? <laughs> it's like insane. It is insane. Uh, Luke, please get the first solo album on Spotify. Such a great album, Davey C. Oh, man, just buy it. Just buy the album. No, I, you know, the thing is, it's not on Spotify. It's not doing anything but collect, collecting dust. And uh, it's something I should call those guys on. Yeah, put my first couple of solo albums up. The ones that they own, anyway. The first three. Why aren't they on Spotify? I'm, I don't know. I never bothered, you know? Oh, I gotcha. And I got a, I'm, a lot of shit going on, you know? Worrying about my early solo albums. It's like, well, I suppose there's something to be said for it. I could make a... Two or three cents, if I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, that, and that is the answer. <laughs> they gotta split it with ten guys. It's not on Spotify. Well, that's why I said just just buy the album. No, I got no beef with Spotify at this point. It's the only record store in town, man. You just gotta bite the bullet and deal with it. Yeah, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Uh, gone or gone are the tower records, man. You know what can I say? You know, go where you go, hang out, and meet people. They turn you on to music. Yeah, I got a band. You want to come jam? You know that sort of shit. Those but are, yeah. anymore. They, they're the commingling of you know people by accident that are musicians is what started so many great bands. And a lot of that meeting place happened to be a record store buying like-minded records or whatever. Oh yeah, you into this? You into this? Oh yeah, well check this out. Oh man, I got a band like that. You know? Yeah, those are the those are the days. How's the hair now, man? It's getting there. It's really. Yeah, yeah there it is. Now I'm getting into a whole thing right now. People, I do this. I do. I'm stone cold sober. I swear to God, I'm like shit. I'm my kids. There you go. All right. Um, People are going like, who the fuck is this old dude? Then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, super Chicks, thank you for the Super Chat. Oh. Hi, Steve. Did you ever hang with Randy Rhodes or Gary Moore? Thanks. Never met Randy, but uh, we, ha I, we had a mutual friend, his first guitar teacher, uh, Steve. Oh, no, it wasn't Steve. It was Scott Shelley. Scott Shelley was uh, taught him guitar, and then, then we had that connection because Scott and Jeff were friends. And uh, Gary Moore, I met a couple of times. We did the Montreal Jazz Festival uh, a couple of times. And uh, wow, what a player. Jeez. I had to follow him. Me and Larry Carlton followed Gary Moore at the Montreal. Gary was on fire that night. We went on about one in the morning. And it was like, geez, he played every note. I think we should just go home. <laughs> you know what I mean, it's like, okay, give him my best shot. That's <laughs> Um, let's see. We've got another one. 
uh, Randy Wilcox. Luke, on Sessions panel, you told a great story about Landau switching charts with you at a session. How would you adapt mentally to playing that environment with guys like that, even at your level? Uh, it was it was written hour, not Landau. I was late to a Gene Page session, and there's like 90-piece orchestra. You know, everything's live. And I was like guitar two or something like that, which is what I should have been. Except a lot of times guitar two sucked because it was the harder part. But, you know, I so I show up late. I might have flat tire for real. I'm most definitely not a, you know, a self-induced bullshit story. I mean, I was really panicking. I mean, this is really early on in my career, so I didn't want to blow it. Gene Page, I'm like, okay, the guy has everything written out, but like, how hard it's supposed to be not that hard. Well, I get there and they have the piano part in D flat without any chord symbols, you know. I must have looked like, I must have looked at Rit like, you know, all the color, like a cartoon, all the color leaves your face, you know. And I just looked at it, I didn't say anything. I just looked at the chart blindly and, and, and Gene was counting it off and Rit just went like this with the charts. And his chart was like tacit, fill, you know, relax. And he was reading all the parts and he saved my ass. And I'm, he didn't have to do that. He could have let me choke. I would have got up to like fucking can't read piano parts. You know? Of course, I don't know too, too many people that can, but especially in D flat. But it was a humbling experience and it showed what, what kind of man uh, Lee Rittenauer is, boy. You know, I never forget it to this day. And I pass it on like, you know, don't be so hard on the new guy because he's the nervous one. I've been the new guy. And a new guy will one day be the big guy, and he won't ever forget. I remember uh, asking Jim Kelton, how, what do I, how, all these good things started happening to me. I started working a whole bunch. I said, man, everything's going so well. I mean, how, how do I pay everybody back? He goes, you got to do it for somebody else, man. That's how it works. Right. But pay forward, you know. Right. So I always, always live by that. That's cool. Uh, we've got Giant Space Monkey who sent us a... Uh, you got a great fan base, man. Oh, it's great. These guys are awesome. Everybody's awesome. Um, Fall Into Velvet is a favorite Luke solo song. Oh, wow. Thanks, man. That was fun. Yes, that was 100% live in the studio except for the vocals. Uh, everything the solos everything i mean reading the parts man it was like and tommy didn't read but he he's got a big ear man he heard the shit a couple times he nailed it and uh, it was just something we wanted to do for fun you know get psychedelic and just jam in the studio old school you know um fall into velvet is a oh, there's pete solo song Yo. Oh, wow. oh look pete's crashing what's up hey pete what's going on man great you can do all the demonstrations my name is I'm Not Worthy. Oh, <laughs> Fuck you. He, he, thought, he thought he would chime in and say hi. What's That's going good, on? Man. I need all the help I can get, man. I would have done my hair better had I known, man. My <laughs> fucking driving me crazy. I got like a short bit here, and I hate the way it, it's it's getting better, but it's... So I, I mean, feel like... I mean, were you late from your grinder photo session? <laughs> <laughs> I have a wicked sense of humor. I'm not serious. <laughs> oh man, are your readers uh, are, are they decreasing? The numbers decreasing yet? Uh, <laughs> oh, since I put it up, I'm sure they're going up actually, which is funny. Um, Waterford Giant gave us a thumbs up super chat. Thank you. I don't know if you had a question. Uh, thumbs up. Or the mm -hmm. thumbs up will work. So is this how you guys fund your cocaine habit? <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> and we love the fans for it. Thank you very hey, much. Hey, you got me for a few more minutes. You know, my girl's cooking me dinner and stuff. I know. We always catch it at dinner time. No, this is perfect. Well, We're well, good. You know, I'm having a blast, but, uh, you know, I'm, I think I'm blowing it now. You got real talent like Pete Thorne over here. Man. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> yeah. What are you guys doing for dinner? What are you guys going to have? Um, no, I have. She cooks like I don't even know it's for dinner, but just everything is gr incredible. Yeah, I just don't say anything. I'm like I've lost weight in this lockdown shit, and I feel good. I'm getting some sun. That's why I'm all. Yeah. I have more sun than I've ever had in my life. Dude, it's yeah. amazing. I mean, eating at home all the time. It's like yeah. you, know, you need to be better cooks. It's incredible. You well, and that, and also you're not eating crap, man. You're not eating chemicals and all this other junk they put in there. You know exactly what you're putting in your food. 
Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not eating as much because I'm not as hungry because it's hot. Mm. And I play with my you know my youngest son in the pool in the afternoons every day, so I get some exercise and some sound. Keep that COVID juice off me. <laughs> <laughs> Get it back. Uh, I wish I could laugh. Fucking hell. Hey, at, at least we have a little fun. I mean, you know, we used to do these things in person. Yeah. That was now we don't even have to wear pants. <laughs> and there's the picture. You don't know, do you? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> 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 See, even old men turn into young little teenage boys when we're put together in the room together. Nothing changes. <laughs> I better get the fuck out of here before I have you know, the FCC comes in here and takes you guys down. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks for the yucks. It'll, it'll be all over the internet. People making fun of my hair. What's wrong? Is he high or something? No, I'm just weird. Old and weird. Don't That's ever it. change. No. <laughs> Okay, I'll see you guys later, man. Are you leaving? Hi. He left. He left. He had to eat. He got called for dinner. Okay. Called for dinner. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, we can finish up ourselves. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh, that was great. God, man. I had to ask him the story about Don because it's like, that's. I knew he was going to say it was, yeah, I think it was first take. You know, it's so amazing that solo and that song. Yeah, he was always the first take. I mean, I remember seeing like him do stuff like that. It was, it was, it was just like put the track up. All right. And yeah, well, you were just, saying that you used to watch him, right? Do the with, yeah, a few, a few, uh, several times I got to watch it a little bit, yeah. especially when it was like quick, you know. And um, it's just like put the track up. Oh, okay, got it. All right, let's go. Just does a solo, and you're just like. Pfft. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> so con so confident and badass. So great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Confident and badass. Yeah. It just chill like I don't know, man. That's it's, I guess it was a magic time and I mean, we got to we got to remember too that like when 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 these records were being made, it was like it was only 10 years after the Beatles or not even maybe eight years or because he really started in the studios. What I, I want to say, like his first sessions were probably seven. Like there was that boss gags record, right? And it was, uh, he was like, seven, seven. He was like 17 or something, you know? Yeah. And just like kicking ass, you know? And uh, that's amazing. I mean, well, he said too, he was like really young with uh, uh, Diana Ross session. Diana Ross. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, yeah. Jeff just called him. He said, get over here and be good. Be good. Be good. So it's kind of like the era of the studio musician. It was just like, I don't know. It was all just starting to kind of happen. And be, I don't know. It's like they. It's like they. They invented it. I don't know. I mean, he is after the Wrecking Crew and stuff. But not, well, not, yeah, no, not, not really. really. But I mean, you know, like he, like he was saying, there's different eras of it. You know, there was like the the, the early the Wrecking Crew, and mm -hmm. and likewise, you had uh, out of Motown in Detroit, you had that the um, can't think of it right now, but that's similar to the Wrecking Crew. You know. Yeah. And um, and then and then you know you had the later Jay Graydon and Lee Rittenhauer kind of era Tommy Tedesco and then that you know transferred into Luke and Landau and then later came Dan Huff and Michael Thompson and Tim Pierce. Right. You know we also don't mention uh, we haven't mentioned in both shows with Luke was Waddy Wachtel. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Waddy was great too. It so was another role. Yeah, big session guy, right? Yeah, man, I I love his playing too. I mean, he's just cool. He he used to for a long time. There was this gig at the Joint here in L.A., which is probably not even. I don't think the Joint's a thing anymore. But it was a club on Pico, and he used to do a, a band. I think it was Monday nights at the Joint. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, and it was Waddy and Rick, the bass player, the guy that played with uh, Neil Young forever, and you know just all these great players. And they used to have people sit in, like Keith Richards would show up, Brian Johnson from ACDC. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like rolling, like uh, Bernard Fowler, right from the Stones, sings with the Stones. He would go down there and sing, and it was just like the best. It was like Monday night, just all these heavies would show up and just rip it up and play, just play great rock songs. It's so fun. And Waddy, you know, and he played like a, I think he played like a Vibro King, maybe like a Fender Vibro King. Yeah, and he did. Paul, and that was it. Like yeah. No, no pedals, no, uh, or maybe he had one. Great. Or something. It's great. Wow. Just bad. Uh, Okay, Stephen Douglas. Uh, 
where did I get the red velvet wallpaper? Well, good question. I don't remember. I might be able to find out for you, though. So email me. Maybe isn't I can figure a, it out. Is that a John Shanks thing? Isn't he? Uh, yeah, but it was it was a, from a wallpaper distributor here in the Valley somewhere. We we actually found a way to get it cheaper than than a designer place. Mm. Um, but it's still expensive and also incredibly ha uh, horrible to hang. Oh, really? <laughs> Well, you gotta have a really good guy because you can't crush the velvet when you're, you know, all right, rolling it and on this. Mm. On the Not only that, there's a lot of waste because you you have to match up the patterns mm. when you're doing the different pieces, and they have to match up perfectly. So there's a there's a lot of precision to hanging it. Mm. And at the time when we did this place, there we I forgot how we got them, but we found this. Uh, we need this wallpaper hanger guy. I think it was the contractor knew him, and he was great. He just laid that stuff like crazy. It's good looking. Yeah, it stands out. Uh, we had a super chat from Taylor three fifteen. Thank you, Luke's next career needs to be a stand up comedian. He's so damn funny. He is. He's he's. Oh on my god! I, I remember seeing him at the baked potato a bunch of times where he would read. He would read from like this. Mm -hmm. the book, yeah. <laughs> the, the, well, there's been very various books over the years. But like, uh, uh, like, like literally porn books. People get up and leave, right? Porn stories, and <laughs> like, he would read it in the most funny way. And, I mean, this was a million years ago, but but you know, in all seriousness, his his like, who wouldn't want that guy on your session? You know, so there's this amazing guitar playing coupled with, of course, we got to have him here. That's gonna right. be great. Sure. It's gonna be right. fun, right? You know, like so much fun, right? You know, totally. He's like one of the funniest people that I've ever met. You know, he's I just a riot. Back yeah, it, used be, it used to be a little crazier, even. I was going to say, <laughs> back in the day when it was a little back crazy. Back in the day when there was more drinking and stuff involved. Right, right. We got a super chat for, for, uh, for Pete. Pete, best road story. Best road story. Thank you, BMO. The one. Uh, well, you okay. can't remember something. Well, okay, one comes to mind where um we were playing okay we were playing in belgium a big rock festival and we were starting a, a run opening dates for aerosmith uh and it was the first one and um it was like a festival in front of like sixty thousand people so this is with chris cornell and uh we're at the hotel and we're in we're in uh brussels and the festival is i know it's about an hour and a half drive from the hotel like outside of town or whatever and um it's like the ride's supposed to show up or whatever it's the van from you know van cut the runners or whatever from the festival come pick you up or whatever so normally we would get to a gig like that at, with plenty of time at least an hour maybe an hour and a half ahead of our set or whatever we're sitting there and time's going and going and going and going and there's no van there's no van and I, i'm looking at my watch and going like okay like we're about an hour and 45 minutes out from the gig right now at least if there's no traffic and just sitting there you know and chris was always just so chill he's just like sitting in the lobby of the hotel just kind of like you know like letting everybody else worry sort of thing. <laughs> he was good about that and uh and i'm starting to like panic you know and and uh i go to the tour manager who was brand new that day it was his first gig and i'm like um dude like where's the van like we gotta go like we gotta get out of here now and and he's like it'll be here relax we had five minutes go by 10 minutes and it's like dude we need to go now like we need to, we need to get in taxis and go now like it doesn't matter what it costs you know and he's like no no man we're just wait and we waited like 10 more minutes and chris's wife is starting to get we're really upset and stuff and it's just like he's like okay let's get in cabs and go <laughs> so it's chris and his wife in one cab and then the rest of the band in another taxi we got in two taxis and we drove for like an hour and a half going like 100 miles an hour all the way to the show <laughs> and literally like we get there and it's like there's festival traffic filtering into the festival is like super busy a police escort somehow shows up and mm. take us like so we're driving down the side of all these cars driving into the festival you know going like probably like 60 miles an hour down down the shoulder you know into this festival and we get there like literally like four minutes before we're supposed to go on and there's like sixty thousand people there <laughs> and we get out of the car and like in ears on you know <laughs> run on stage <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, we, and we play the show and we like made it and i don't know there's something about the energy of that like just that chaos of like sh you know and then after that after the gig or whatever it was like <sighs> because we could just relax you know it ended up being a great show and all that but 
I remember hanging out later that night, like probably the same runners that were supposed to come pick us up were driving us back and they were like lost. And not only until like getting us back to, to into Brussels. And and it was just the band guys. It wasn't Chris. And and so and I remember we'd all had a few drinks and stuff. So we were kind of lit and it had been this like stressful day. And I remember the, they were kind of like, we're talking, and we're like in the back, we're like, these guys know where they're going. And we're like, you know, talking like I talk right now. And they were like starting to make that we could I could tell they were making fun of us in French, like just kind of like bagging on us or whatever so we, we get in a, like kind of like a fight with these guys <laughs> he's like what the fuck like you guys he's like screw us around like you don't come pick us up and then now you're like kind of like and you obviously don't know where you're going to get back and stuff and we ended up getting out of the van and i remember they ended up driving off and like flipping us off and i remember throwing a bottle at the van <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, you know, like that kind of thing. Just like, and then making our way back into Belgium, <laughs> probably going out for a couple of drinks or something like that. How would you get back? I, uh, we were close enough that it, we could catch a cab. We were in like the outskirts of, of Brussels somewhere. But these guys were just idiots. It's so funny. They'd like screwed us up all day or whatever. So we get back and that tour manager, I'll never forget the next day we flew to London and everybody was just livid with that dude because of the, uh, the, the whole thing. We get checked into the hotel in London and we go up to our rooms and then that guy, I end up seeing him snake off by the front desk with his bag, like out the door. And we never saw him ever again. He just left. He quit. He just bailed. <laughs> and so now we've got no tour manager. And we're in London starting a tour with Aerosmith. So the oh, lighting yeah. guy, it's like, you're tour managing, you know? And the, he's like, I don't know how to tour manage. I've never tour managed before. And it's like, you're tour manager. <laughs> so he ended up doing it for the next week. And he did better than that guy. So... Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so the white guy did better than the guy. <laughs> yeah crazy. yeah well that guy he just totally blew it it was crazy i remember the dude we'd had out was queens of the stone age guy and he was awesome he was like totally together really great guy and then he had to go back to queens and then we end up with this dude i, I actually i was about to say his name i'm not gonna say his name that would be terrible oh. but anyways because his name's really funny but um <laughs> <anyway>. <laughs> <laughs> that was it was crazy. This was like one of those road things. But that, yeah, then we ended up doing Dublin and London. And, and, and actually, that, that was when we played in London. It was uh, June 24th, my birthday, 2007. And, and we opened for Aerosmith at Hyde Park. And, the, and Chris had the whole crowd sing me happy birthday. So that was another great. That was like the next day after all that chaos. So, wow. Uh, yeah, it was like 60,000 people. And he's like, hey, it's that guy's birthday. I, I remember I was tuning and I wasn't looking up. And I was like, okay, I got a minute to tune. And he's like, it's somebody's birthday, you know, today. And I had totally forgotten it was my birthday. And he's like, it's that guy right over there. Sing him happy birthday. It's Pete, you know, or whatever. All of a sudden I look up and I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit, he's talking about me. And he had everybody sing me happy birthday. <laughs> That was a fun couple days. That's a nice yeah. moment. Cool. Uh, we got a super chat from Vinny Moretti. What's up, Vinny? Vincent, uh, my coffee buddy. I see my oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, he says, Dave, does it make sense to split the guitar signal at the beginning of the chain with one signal going to the front of the amp effects and the other going straight to the wet buffer bay? I'm not sure what he's asking. Uh, mm. <laughs> does it make sense to split the guitar signal at the beginning of the chain with one signal going to the front of the amp effects and i don't know what you're saying exactly i yeah. think vincent was asking about this on my show you mean like to have some effects like some, a dry signal and then like a a, a, a wet chain yeah i don't think so uh, like I think, yeah, I think that's what he means but i don't think so i think that it's not a good idea <laughs> Well, it can be a not a good idea for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, one phase, uh, uh, depending on what pedals you have, they can flip your phase. They can partially flip your phase. Um, uh, like, for instance, like an EP booster doesn't flip the phase 180 degrees. Really? It just puts it slightly out of phase. Oh, no, really? <laughs> Is that part of the sound of an EP booster? Is that part of the or uh, that style of pedal? Like an uh, I, uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I just know that it does that. I, and, and I learned the hard way that it does that. Um, hmm. and then also like if anything, any DSP based pedal that isn't an analog dry path is also going to shift slightly hmm. your phase. So anytime you're combining things like that, it's going to get weird unless of course, the effects are 100% wet in that other chain, then it then it can work. Hmm. I keep telling Vinny, just do it the way I have it set up, and it'll work fine. Wet, dry, wet, usually the line out to the effects, and 
then the effects to the power amp and you'll be fine and the power amp to your two out, outside speakers and do you run dry in your setup dry in your wet caps yes i'm now, now i am now you are now yeah, yeah. i wasn't before yeah. but now i am yeah cool um we got a super chat from Vibhas patil how are you? Thank you. Dave, can you please talk about buffers? I'm building a board with 12 pedals, pedals or so. Do you recommend both a buffer at the start and the end of a chain? Also, thoughts on buffers and pedals such as the J-Rocket Archer? Okay, well, I'm going to say here, I'm going to make it really confusing. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on specifically what your pedals are. Uh, you know, like for instance, if you have a bunch of fuzz pedals, I wouldn't recommend a buffer in front of them. So it, let's say you had a few fuzz pedals on your board. I'd recommend the guitar going into the fuzzes. Then your wah, maybe if you have a wah. Uh, then a buffer. I also don't like buffers that much in front of wahs. I like like kind of... Just a, in front of wahs? I don't love buffers in front of wahs. What if the wah is true bypass? Probably maybe the best way to do is have a true bypass wah. Well, I mean, I just don't like the tone. What it does, the buffer does sometimes too, at least more vintage style wahs. I mean, yeah. some, some newer wahs already have a buffer in front on the inside. Right. So so it doesn't really matter for them. But there's there's un, like a vintage traditional wah, like putting a buffer in front changes the tone. Of That's interesting. But don't they kind of screw the screw the direct sound a bit? If they're not true bypass, some some wahs have tone suck, right? Yeah, well, yeah, actually, a vintage a vintage wah has no true bypass, and it totally loads down the guitar massively. Um, but you know, I'm not saying that that's a good or bad thing. It, mm -hmm. You know, like you know, people never, you know, all these records that you loved, right? Right, right. Had a non true bypass wah in in the chain. You know, it's like loading the guitar down like a considerable amount and these people just you know and people that were doing these records just turned the treble up on their amp more i, I mean you know that's basically it. Now, what they're hearing out of the amp oh we'll just change the eq and you know get what we want can you use mod those old fuzzes though for or i mean was for true bypass yeah yeah totally i used to do a ton of those tons of wah mods a long time ago and then maybe run a buffer after yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, I'd, I'd have fuzzes, and then, and like, if you have fuzzes, then a, a, if you had a traditional wah, a, a vintage -y wah, a, a, you know, there, then I'd have a buffer. Then your other stuff. But there's a lot of knowing and years of experience knowing what certain, so there's some other pedals that don't necessarily want the buffer, and it might sound a little bit better if you don't have the buffer in front. Uh, and at a buffer at the end of the chain can be a good idea. It again, though, it just depends on what your pedals are. So, like for instance, if you have a boss delay at the end of your chain, it's redundant to have a buffer after it because it it's acting like a buffer. Right. Um, if it's a complete true bypass chain, it might be a good idea to have it at the end of the chain. You don't necessarily have to. So I don't, I, it's impossible to answer entirely. And, you know, as far as buffers in certain pedals like the Archer or, or this or that, I, I mean, yeah, they're, I mean, they're just, they can be good. I don't, it's so every, I always look at it as what pedals do you want to use? Okay. I know that if you're using a phase 90, you want that before distortion. Phase 90 sound way better in front of distortion pedals than it does after the distortion pedal. Uh, personally, Univibes also I prefer before the distortions. Yep, totally. Because after the distortion, although it's a sound, they sound sort of fritzy sounding, like it's hard to explain, not, you know. And there's certain other modulations. Some, I mean, some modulations can sound okay in a loop of an amp, let's say. But there's a lot of them that just sound better up front. I like flangers in front. Yeah, it, it's. But again, it depends on what pedal, what it is, you know. I mean, just every great flanger sound I can think of was always in front. Thank you. I was always in front. You know, it's just like they had cranked up amp. Everything was in front, actually. <laughs> everything they was in front. Cranked that... up amps that were distorting, and yeah. everything was in front. But I think we could argue like. 
some stuff came later that was cool, like, you know, obviously chorusing and pitch stuff that was late, that was post distortion, yeah. certain things, but flangers for some reason. I don't know why. Like, I can't think of an amazing flanger tone that was done post overdrive. It was all electric mistresses and stuff, and or uh, you know, the MXR or the Jet Flanger. Or, or no, that. but then there's some oddballs, like, for instance, like, um, um, Tom Morello. Well, yeah, right. He runs his whole pedal board mm. every in the loop of that Marshall. Hmm. Cause why is Wawa sounds like that? Yeah. And, it, it, and it, it's totally different. Whammy's in the, in the loop too. It's his sound. And it, it's his sound, you know, that head through that PV four twelve. Yeah. It's the old PV really well made four by twelves that they, they had uh, previous to the 5150 era. And, um, they're really well made, real stiff, tight. But uh, but that amp through that cab, some sort of PV speakers, I think. Scorpions, I think it's just one of those. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> created uh, created a cool sound. I mean, yeah. That's yeah, we... why I always say. That's why I always say I'm not a cookie cutter pedal board guy. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you got to do it this way. You, you don't have to do it this way. It, it's a it's your own artistic expression. If you want your delay first in the chain, your wah last, who's to say that's wrong? It's just a different sound. Yeah. And and who and who am I to tell you that what you like is wrong? Yeah. I mean, I think that just takes, you know, there's other people that do boards and stuff and they tend to have a cookie cutter approach to things and they, they it has to be this way, it has to be that way. And over the years, I've just learned that that just, I've had artists that are polar opposite to that. And I'm like, really, you want it that way? Okay. And then I'd listen to it and it works for them. Sure. It can be cool. It, it, at least it's different. It's not the same. You know, I think that's how great guitar sounds were made. Totally. You know, it's like they, they experimented like Ty Tabor, you know, with his the, the Fender Elite guitar with the preamp into the lab series and cranked up with, you know, whatever. Well, you yeah. To that point, you know, I think that like that's part Roger, of the uh, no, MIDI verb. A MIDI verb, yeah. This is part of the shit that these guys used to do. And now people the questions are great. It's great to ask questions, you know, but the spirit of experimentation is a little less than it used to be, where maybe it was just because there was no internet forums and stuff, and it was just like people are like, I don't know, plug this into this and see what happens, see if it blows. It's like Eddie Van Halen with a variac and just, I don't know, that's a light that maybe if it's the light dimmer thing, let's turn that down and see if it you know, right. and, you know that's a sound and and even just turning a Marshall on 10 <laughs> you know like yeah. that's cool. just, let's see what happens if we just do this <laughs> you know and then like making a whole sound out of that like kind of crazy I don't know that was it that, that's how this great stuff happened you know yeah it's true, it's true. Yeah. going against the rules right Totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, it's funny. It's just like, uh, let me just say like the, the engineers in the city, like recording engineers, the whole term comes because they used to be like, they used to dress in lab coats and like with pocket protectors. And, you know, you have to, put, if you've ever seen like, like the early, uh, you know, in British recording days before the Beatles and stuff, as they described it, you know, you'd go into the studio and the guy, there would be a guy that placed the microphone in front of the amplifier. It was like, you cannot place it any closer. That's where the microphone goes on the guitar amplifier in our studio. And then like, you know, things like levels and everything. Oh, we don't, you know, mess around. And, and luckily George Martin was crazy enough to like, you know, realize the genius and go, you know what, let these guys have at it. They're kind of crazy, but, and that, and that shit all changed, you know, and, yeah. and really the Beatles that blew it wide open, that spirit of experimentation. But until then it was like, you're going to turn it up. Oh no, 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 no. We don't do that here. You know? And it was like, and then, and then all the experimentation like Hendrix did and stuff with it, you know? Oh yeah. Uh, flipping the tape around and, tape flange and all crazy psychedelic things and yeah groundbreaking eddie kramer too and okay, kind of yeah, yeah. yeah is he just you know i did or he was on our show with tim pierce that i used to do and uh he just said we were in a constant he goes it was a competition between me and hendrix like oh you're gonna do that you're gonna get weird like well i'm gonna do this then like with the pan knobs or throw the mic out of phase or do some crazy shit you know <laughs> let's let's phase the whole you know mix or something and, and so they were and it was that they were just getting crazy so <laughs> hey, why did you uh and tim stop doing the show you know 
it's like we didn't stop doing the show. Uh, it's like it's almost like a band that that never broke up, but they just you know they're on hiatus indefinitely. It's like I think I probably went on the road or something, and you know, and then came back, and we just didn't get you know. He he started doing a, uh, shows like I think he likes to do like have somebody else to play off of, but maybe it's not always me. Maybe it's like different because he has a lot of guests and things. Mm -hmm. You know, and then maybe I, I started doing my Sunday show and occasionally I have guests and you know how it is. It's cool when there's a variety. Right. right of course, yeah. And uh, and so maybe it was just that for him, you know, and then we did a couple things together since then. And stuff. it's not like there was ever like, a, oh, we don't want to do this anymore. It was more like we just kind of like started doing different things and his YouTube kind of went a certain way. You know, and he's done really, really well with this thing. So it's like I love that. Guy. I mean, it's like this, if, if you ever wanted to do it again. I it, also there was the the aspect of um it it was tough to to get to find first of all the time to get together to do it all the time because we never did it at a regular time and then also just technically like editing it and stuff was tough like and and we tried to do a live stream like this once together at his place and we just had some technical problems and it didn't quite fly um but this would be would have been the way to do the Tim and Pete show but this didn't exist like this live streaming thing back when we were even though it's only a few years ago that we were making those shows Nobody was right. live streaming back then. We were filming it and then editing it. And it took a long time, like doing it that way to, to yeah. get it together. So I think it was just the way that it kind of, you know, happened. I'd love to get it. We have a great chemistry. Like, yeah, you guys are great together. Just like a, yeah. He's, I mean, he's genius, you know, and he's such a nice guy. He's like the nicest guy in the music business. Well, ho hopefully we can have you, uh, you and Tim on maybe before the end of the year. I'd love to come yeah, on. Let's, Tim, let's do it. Yeah, let's definitely do it. Um, I know Larry's been asking this question a bunch of times. Dave, is the EL84 close to the Variac tone? Uh, not necessarily, no. Um, EL84s can sound very different depending on the power section that they're in. So, uh, you know, like people, people have this idea what an EL84 sounds like. And I don't believe in any of that. Because I've proven it wrong. Like, I mean, the, the EL84s we use in our little 20 watt amps, I've compared them, like when I did the JJ Jr., I compared it directly to the 100 watt power section. And at moderate volumes, meaning you're not pushing either power section into distortion, they sound virtually identical. Mm. Same size, same width, same everything. Maybe it's more so, to do with the circuit than it is the type of tube. Yeah, it has a lot to do with the circuit. I mean, people associate like it's a Vox. You know, they associate a Vox with an EL84, and a Vox is a Vox. It's it's a whole amp, and it's not just the EL84s. It's how the rest of the circuit is in the amp too. Uh, you know, and the funny thing, a top boost Vox isn't really that far off from a Marshall. <laughs> it's really the same architecture. What about? Uh, uh, I've always wondered about like AC50s. Uh, is that close to like a top boost, but with the L34s? Uh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of like a top boost circuit um, with cathode biased uh, EL34s. No negative feedback. So it's the same idea. Bigger wow. tube. And how do those sound? Do you like those? Have you ever tried one? They can sound pretty cool. They're not the, like the favorite. When people go for a Vox, they, you know, of course, in, in this day and age, people, you know, they think of a Vox as a as a as a one of the, one that exists now. Um, hmm. I wouldn't call that really a Vox. I mean, if you try an old Vox and you compare it to one of the brand new ones, you're going to be like, "Oh shit, no." Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I that mean, ma that magic you know, chimey thing is pretty. I, I mean, there's a certain thing, and also they can be, man, an old Vox too, like a vintage one. They can be mean and rude and like m almost martially. You crank them, yeah. they, they sound like a Marshall or something, you know. But a but a with a Voxy character, you know. You've got a nice one in the hallway there, don't you? Yeah, the hallway. You've got it's that blue one, right? Yeah, that one sounds good. Yeah, yeah, really good. So, um, that's a cool one. I'm happy to have that back. <laughs> mm. Tim was so nice about that. Getting it back to you? Yeah. Yeah, Tim. Yeah. Had <laughs> yeah, I was supposed to do some videos and stuff with him, but it's like we did one and then we just didn't do more. And it's like I, I, I still want to, you know, work it off or do something or pay mm. him or something. Mm. Yeah. 
That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Casey says, love Pete Thorne. Thanks for your input. Thanks, Patrick. I'm glad that we, all, we all love Pete Thorne. <laughs> we all love some Pete Thorne, right? Guitar nerd. <laughs> That's every all I am. That's <laughs> all <laughs> so you do every single day with no days off. Are you, uh, by the way, I, I, uh, I ordered an ombre. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah, great little amp. So much fun, actually. Wait a minute. How did you order an ombre? How did I order an ombre? Yeah, did you order it through? Yeah, I, con I contacted uh John? Yeah. That's the oh, company. okay, cool. Um, yeah, they're they're building it. I guess they're a little back-ordered right now. It's so. a fun amp, man, to sit around and just jam on. Where's mine? It's right there. Uh, it's like, so just to plug, just when you get it, plug it in. And just turn it up to five and just play with no one. Don't even plug in a tuner. <laughs> just plug it in and you're like, oh, it's so much fun. I, I did that for like 45 minutes when I first. Is it super loud? No. I mean, it's no. great. Well, it's, it's reasonably loud. Reasonably loud. Yeah. I mean, you could play a small club with it, I would say, and do a okay. cool blues rock gig. But it's not. It's 22 watts or something. 20 watts, 22 watts. Uh, All right. But really, it, I mean, your ears will ring a little afterwards, but you'll have so much fun you won't notice. You know, it's like it's really sweet sounding. The mids on that amp are just, it's you know, it's it's really marsh. It's like proto Marshall. I mean, really, right, Dave? I mean, similar, right? Yeah, the brown face. Uh, yeah, I have to look at the circuit. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, it's similar. It's I guess it's a okay. So now I'm going to sound like an amp guy. Double long tail phase inverter. Is that? Uh, uh, yeah, long tail phase inverter, long tail long. phase inverter. So that's the typical Fender, Marshall, everything. But basically. different than Tweed, right? Uh, different, totally different than Tweed. Uh, uh, yeah, so totally they, different than Tweed. They went uh, to that, and it has a presence circuit too. So it's more, it has more, uh, it has more of what was used uh, the the architecture a little bit more what was used in a tweed basement in some respects uh, at least in the in the long tail with the presence and everything you know and then a uh, and then 312 x7s so that was a, these are the big changes from tweed amps as i understand yeah I, although uh, you know like i have to look at the circuit to remember what the brown face is exactly because I, I i never get to work on those the uh, rare you don't see them, see them yeah i never see them and so they're not in my radar all the time. So I just can't remember. I got to look. <laughs> it's like a funny accident kind of amp that I think Leo, <laughs> like, they probably made it. And then, went, oh, no, 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 no. This is far too dirty. And then that's 1962, you know. And then, yeah. like, and then rock and roll hap really happens, you know. And it's it just kind of wigs like a little blip in time. But um, they're pretty magic sounding. I mean, it, it really has a lot in common with if you like a Marshall. Yeah. Yeah, well, your video sold me. I was like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, no, it sounds good. Yeah. It's a really sweet sounding man. Like, just really fun to play through with just a Les Paul or something, and no, uh, no pedals. It'll feed back, and it's not very dirty. It's just like the mids in it. The con the mids are just like perfect. And then like you play a note, and it starts feeding back. You're like, "God, it's not a lot of gain, but it sort of feels like there's a lot of gain." Right, still a lot of sustain to it. That's awesome. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, hey, in, case, in case anyone joined late, Luke, Steve Lukather was on the show. He was here. <laughs> right, right. He had to go eat dinner. He had to go eat dinner. So uh, if you, if you happen to miss that, uh, and you're like going, wait, wait a minute, wasn't this Lukather? That doesn't. Look yeah. He doesn't look like Lukather. I look like Lukather. Can't play, hair. Can't play even close to Lukather. <laughs> you were nice enough to have um, me uh, join. So oh, yeah. Yeah. That yeah was really I didn't fun, know you were going to leave that soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess he, he. I think he did that last time too, didn't he? Like when you guys did no, the other. No, to the end last time. Well, he okay. had to go, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. He had to go, but yeah. But this time, I think he was just like, "Okay, I'm, I'm really freaking hungry." Yeah. <laughs> um, I got some questions for where my new PRS is. You guys want to see it? I can, I can, I can grab it. Sure. Okay, I'll be right back. You, <laughs> you take a question. Hey, Art uh, Flor Floresca. Um, <coughs> said, have you ever, what do you think of the Laney AORs from the 80s? Uh, there were a bunch of different versions of it over time. Uh, there was the Pro Tube Lead, which was the first version before it really became AOR. Those were basically like JC made hundreds. 
and then uh, and then the first AOR series, and then I think there was another series right after. I, the, um, you know, I think Lane was kind of a pioneer, honestly, for um, more modern architecture, high gain amp. I think I think later that you know they uh, if you look if you just look at schematics of them and stuff, you're like, oh yeah, I see. Oh yeah, this was done later here, and this was done. They were really like you know the op amp based effects loops that worked well, and they they really had had it very early. Isn't a clip a clip is basically like a Marshley, but it's got a treble booster built in, right? Clip Something there. like that. I have to look at that circuit again too. Uh, the, yeah, the, well, the clip, yeah, that's a whole different thing. That's a whole different era. Um, but the uh, super group, not the super group. Right? The super groups are awesome amps, though. They're basically a mark of you know plexi Marshall architecture, kinda. Yeah. And uh, super high play voltage, mm. so they were just bombastically punchy and loud and cool. Dude, I almost bought one. Like I was going down to buy it with the money, and a guy had bought it twenty minutes before. I I had played it a few. It was at uh, Vintage Gear on John Nelson's old shop where I, yeah. where I worked briefly in the mid nineties. Uh, and he had this super group, and I had played. You know, it was wasn't it, it wasn't expensive. I mean, he was going to sell it to me for nine hundred dollars or something, you know. But it, yeah. this, was long, this was a long time ago. But I, 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 I mean, all right, I'll, that amp sounds unbelievable. I mean, you know, going in and turning it up to ten and going like, oh my god, like this amp sounds like. And it was a lot less yeah. than you could buy a Plexi for or something. And uh, and I went down to get it, and he's like, man, this guy just came and got it like half an hour ago, and I was like. Oh gotta be I'm so excited you know I was like okay I'm, I'm getting it right I get it it was a hundred or 120 watt or 100 watt or whatever super group it's a, it was so cool <laughs> yeah it was cool but they're brutal brutal, High -end. brutal but wow. cool what amp was this again the laney uh super group like era okay. the white paneled cool and basically like tony ayami situation right. but and then later, I think they made the clip, which probably was because Tony had used treble boosters. I, I would guess. And they're like, well, guys seem to like these. Let's build it into the amp or whatever, right? Right, right. I think that's what the clip head was. But but yeah, the Super Group was killer. They had the Partridge Transformers or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So here's the uh, PRS. Oh, wow. Looks yeah. like the sea, man. Looks like crazy top. Yeah, and, yeah, and, it's the ocean. And then uh, this is the back. Oh, pretty man. What's the neck? Is it rosewood or something? It's, it's no, corn? it's uh, it's, fl it's roasted maple, flame maple. Oh, it's roasted maple. Yeah, was, is that like it's heavily food? roasted? Wow. Yeah, heavily roasted. That's like mm -hmm. that neck will be stable as hell. It won't move. I bet. Yeah, it's really great. Ebony fingerboard. Uh, it's uh, actually African blackwood. What's that? Uh, probably uh, ebony yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a version of ebony <laughs> it's a version of ebony yeah basically it's a wood that's used uh primarily i, I think it in like wood instruments like woodwind instruments it'd, oh. it'd be like it'd be like stumbling upon a tree and what are we going to call this ah uh, uh blackwood yeah what would you call blackwood it's black <laughs> yeah have you guys heard of zirocote no that's this wood that I'm going to try on a guitar that it's, it's like if you want rosewood, but okay. So like ebony is harder and a little more brittle and, and it sounds brighter, you know, and that, mm -hmm. but I love the look of it, but like, maybe it's like too bright for some guitars. And so zero Cote was recommended to me and it's like somewhere in between rosewood and ebony, but it looks like it's got some really interesting grain, grain patterns and it can get really dark and stuff. So I think I'm going to try it. Cause I, I like, Generally speaking, my only d dilemma with rosewood boards is when they get light, it drives me crazy when they look too. I like I like real dark rosewood. Hmm. You know, so I like Les Paul. Well, some Les Paul, you know when you see a Les Paul historic and it's got like light rosewood on it? Yeah, no, I hate yeah, that. It doesn't look right. I can forget right. it. I can't. I don't like it. <laughs> you know, it's really cool. We did we did a couple of guitars and 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 occasionally people will complain about this, but uh Grover had some amazing old rosewood you know he had a stock forever like and there were pieces that were figured mm. like unbelievably figured like mm. like like flame rosewood well not just not really flame but like even like you know totally green. like green. a line running through the rosewood that's almost like white in color 
Right, right. That's and, and, and like to dark, and it, and he, we did this one guitar. We put one piece on, and like towards the the side of the fingerboard, the top side of the fingerboard, it was almost like blonde, and then it had these stripes through it, and it was looked so fucking cool. <laughs> mm, wow, wow. You know, but like for instance, like uh, like in Japan, they hate any kind of figuring in the rosewood it's got to oh, really? be dark hmm. and uniform because they just it they they think it looks cheap hmm. I, I think the figuring actually looks more expensive <laughs> yeah, I, do. I, I think it adds to the look of the guitar it's kind of it's cool. just a mattering of opinion <laughs> yeah whatever you're into yeah. i guess yeah it's, well, it's also very traditional they're all i think a lot of people in japan are very traditional right like the, yeah and i think brazilian was pretty dark generally speaking so maybe it's that because knowing they, they like old gibson fender you know right pop. right yeah that real dark stuff um mm -hmm. we had a super chat from super chicks what do you think of the fender pro junior uh, four four there's a four pro junior four i never heard of a pro junior four wasn't the pro junior the the little tweed fender with the two el84s yeah in it and a volume and a tone. One Jeff Beck used. I, think. I don't. I don't know what the four is because I haven't kept up. But I mean, the original Little Pro Junior was awesome. <laughs> yeah, they were cool, right? You could crank that up, and it sounded really cool. And it was just a tiny little amp, and it sounded really good. Yeah, good stuff. If you if you had a big amp, it, you know, it was really cool. I remember. I think Rusty Anderson did this once, or or someone. If you had a really big amp like a marshall kind of amp and, and you have a 412 and you had that going and then you had this little tiny 110 you know blues junior and you you would kick it in right like, to, to add to the tone brian ray did it was that. amazing how huge it got mm, yeah it's and a great it, solo boost the yeah, best. yeah it's, it's just like adds this whole nother dimension and all of a sudden the tone just goes whoop you know yeah and uh and and you're like looking at the little amp, just going, really? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. When I was gigging with, I used to play with Brian Ray and do local gigs a bit and stuff. And he would do that. He'd use like a, you know, one of his divided buys or maybe a Marshall or you know different amps, and then he'd kick in a little amp, a little tweet yeah. for solos. It's great. Uh, yeah. And but I think Jeff Beck was doing that too, like Marshall and Pro Junior. That was his thing. Yeah. You know, because it makes it just Phil. Well, Phil X does it too. He he likes. See, now that. I want a Pro Junior. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the Jeff Beck model. Jeff or, Beck, he's, yeah. or he's saying super chick. I'm not sure if it's a girl or a guy. Um, yeah. So that's cool. Uh, looking. Okay. So we got a question here. Christian Palladino, Dave and Mark love the show. I've got a 72 and a 71 Marshall SLP that have ghost notes on leads. I've replaced the caps, but it didn't help. Any ideas on what that could be? That's the good stuff. You want that? That's the good stuff. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, guess what? That's um, that's just gonna happen. Uh, well, one, it can be cone cry from your speaker. Mm, that's true. Uh, and yeah. you might be able to get it out of the amp, but I don't know if you'd like the tone after you did that. You might be able to increase the filtering in the amp, where it kind of filters most of it out. But uh, you know, personally, I mean, I I think that's you know, you, you know, I'm one of these guys that like love those little things. So like the little bit of cone cry and stuff, thing, I think makes it interesting sounding. The you know your your strings ringing or your tremolo springs ringing out in the back of the guitar, I find that interesting. Hmm. I I don't want to take it away. I maybe I grew up in a different time, but I, no one never put a fret wrap on something or no one never put <laughs> foam behind their springs and their strat. I mean they. It, it was just what it was, and you know, little sounds came through and stuff, and it made the music interesting. I don't know. You're you're, you're the one that really taught me about low filtering in a Marshall and about the eras, and it, it is interesting. But I would think an amp by seventy or seventy one or seventy two, they've got a little stuff for filtering. They shouldn't have. Yeah, but they still can cone cry a little bit. You know, well, well, I mean, a lot of times the speaker it depends on what speakers you're using too. Yeah, uh, yeah. and. Uh, 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 a lot of times, once you hear the cone cry in a speaker, though, you can never get it out of your head. Yeah, so, so you're, you're, you know, 
<laughs> Whenever I go to G Sharp, <laughs> it's like you're kind of screwed. <laughs> yeah. For those that don't know, what is what is uh, Ghost Notes? It's like it's like a, a how do you describe it? For those well, it's uh, well, how do you describe? Uh, it's like a little octave pedal that's on really lightly in the background or heavily, depending on the era amp. Like, I mean, you you try cranking up a JTM forty five or something that with low filtering, yeah. and you'll hear Ghost Notes. Oh boy. Yeah, I mean, I had a I had a guy that was complaining in my small box about ghost notes, because in the small box I don't have extremely low filtering, but it's a little closer to a JTM forty five. Mm. Uh, well, actually, it is a JTM forty five filtering. Yeah. Um, so um, it just sounds cool with the small box. It just it, it just sounds good. So yeah, I've only had one person that complained about it though. That ever and I, I increased the filtering of it a little bit and I fixed it for him, or at least reduced it to a point where he was okay with it. It's funny. I see there's a guy in the chat there asking a question about if I only used a pedal board, what would be on it? And I was about to. I was thinking right now about the uh, uh, Origin Effects Revival Drive because that's the one pedal I tried. It's got this Ghost Notes control on it. See, and, and it's unbelievable. It's like the greatest Marshally distortion pedal because you can blend in this ghost note thing. And it's like when you hear it, then you're like, oh, everything sounds. It's amazing. On single notes, you hear it, and it can be like ever so slightly annoying or something sometimes if it's too much, right? But when you play chords, it's there too. And when you try it on this pedal, because it's it's like a it's like a way to simulate ghost notes and instantly hear the effect of it with a control where you can dial it out, and you're like. Oh my God, it makes the chord so fat when you add a little bit of that. And it's like, that sounds like a Marshall, like mm. more than a lot of pedals, which is like, yeah. you know, so it's really cool because it's a JTM 45 style drive. The only one I can think of where they kind of nailed that ghost thing, but mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, Eric Johnson, any new cables that have come out uh, and Dave approves of last I heard was make your own with some crazy building from bulk. Well, I know Signum uh pedals from our buddy Vinny moretti check out signum uh, i'll put a link in our thing um but dave who do I, you mean, I still personally love 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 uh belden 9778 guitar cable i think it's great either that or 8412 belden that was the pete cornish kind of cable um those two still to me sound super cool you know, I, it's funny. There was a little cable shootout that um, I, I happened upon that Ver, uh, Mason from Vertex did, and he did it with Justin Derrico, a friend of ours. And and um, and I, it was uh, Justin's just playing, and they recorded all the stuff and listened to the cables. And uh, man, again, it's still those two cables kind of came out on top for me. I mean, they did clean parts, dirty parts. You know, they tried to make it as scientific as possible. Did they do like 20 foot cables so you can actually hear? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they were all 20 foot cables mm -hmm. and all, all different brands, Mogami, everything, you know, like a bunch of bunch of different brands. Interesting. It was pretty, it was pretty cool, informative listening video. It's cool. Yeah. So, awesome. yeah. Um, so I think we should wrap it up. Um, let's uh, let me run through the next guest. By the way, guys, um, check out Sweetwater, please, in the link we provide. That um, that's a an affiliate link, so please click on that if you guys want to buy anything from Sweetwater, like uh, Luke's guitar or anything like that. Um, or like a Bricosti reverb. What's that? Or like a Bricosti reverb. Yeah, it's a reverb. Is that that like five thousand dollar reverb or something? Yeah, or 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 like you know like some crazy PRS. Yeah, like a like a like that yeah. one that Mark's got. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, um, or a Friedman amp. Or a Friedman amp. Exactly. Do it. Um, <laughs> we've got a. Also, check out Pete's shows on Sunday. Yes, please. Coffee with Pete, or whatever you want to, whatever you call it. Sunday live. Yeah, Sunday Live. I don't know. I just that's what I called it the first week. I was like, what am I gonna call it? Sunday Live. That's yeah. Uh Sunday's at eleven, but not really like eleven twenty five by the time I get my it's whatever the hell Pete gets in and starts the show. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes uh Sunday mornings can be a little lazy for me. Uh thank you very much for giving me the plug and for having me. So oh, of course. Uh you know, last minute. Anytime. And I'm not worthy. 
<laughs> uh, we've got Dave Wiener coming on October 9th. Oh, cool. Uh, he's from Steve Vai's band. Um, he's a Friedman artist as well, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, James Santiago from UA, Universal Audio, is on October 23rd. We've got Martin Kidd of Victory Amps on October 30th. Uh, Josh Fiden, is that how it? Yeah, it? from Voodoo uh, Lab. Voodoo Labs, November 13th. Toast First Lock. ever interview, ever. First ever, yeah. <laughs> That'll be cool. <laughs> Tosin Abasi, November 20th. Hopefully, he'll be good for that. Uh, I just booked Lindy Fralin for December 4th. Yeah, great. And, uh, and then hopefully, we can get Tim Pete on December 18th. I'd love to. All right, I'll, I'll reach out to you and Pete, uh, Tim uh, over the weekend. Um, make good. sure you guys click, click the bell and subscribe or do the other way around. Subscribe and click the bell. Something like that. Something like that, exactly. You got to say it like, uh, make sure you hit the subscribe if you haven't yet and hit the bell besides the subscribe and you'll get an alert every time we put out a new video. Oh, you're the man. <laughs> I can put it at the bottom of our thing all the time. <laughs> I've done this before. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to isolate that. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you're you. You're watching Tone Talk down the way, and you'll see at the end, you'll hear your voice, you'll be like, wait a minute. <laughs> Where's my royalty? <laughs> well, guys, please press subscribe and and, uh, and click like, and we, we really appreciate you watching the show. We'll be back uh, next, I guess, what did I say, with Dave Wiener on whatever day that was. October 9th? Was October 9th. So it's a week go. from today. A week from today. We'll see you next uh, Friday. Pete, thanks so much. You guys check out Pete's channel. All right? Thanks so much. Have a great weekend, everybody. Cool. You guys, too. All right, hang on while I hang up. <laughs>